we have recording. Perfect, thank you. All right, so this information is from the Urban School Insurance Consortium, which I'll be referring to as USIC, as well as there are comments from one of our staff members in here um, speaking to some of the points. So this was sent out to all USIC members. We have been in discussion with school boards across North America over the past week. Some divisions are contemplating not, mandata ma not mandating vaccinations in their boards for employees. Underwriters, and there is a definition of an underwriter, are professionals who evaluate and analyze the risks involved in insuring people and assets. Insurance underwriters establish pricing for accepted insurable risks. The term underwriting means receiving remuneration for the willingness to pay a potential risk. Underwriters use specialized software and actual data to determine the likelihood and magnitude of the risk. So the underwriters have been pushing back as they see this decision as going outside of the norm and increased potential for financial harm, which is the harm to the insurance company, the underwriter of a potential loss. If the loss is too great, they will no longer insure the sector, in this case, education. We have been requested to draft um, a communication for USIC in an effort to inform all boards of these developments and the possible financial harm that boards could incur losing current insurance coverage and required to source our own coverage this would be at a much higher cost this is the communication it has come to our attention that some school divisions are contemplating going against the advice of government of canada alberta public service alberta education alberta health services and health canada with respect to the recent precedent in having all employees being fully vaccinated to assist in stopping the spread of covid 19. For your information, insurers in Canada and London are aware of some of these discussions. This may affect the pools, USIC, in securing reasonably priced insurance or insurance as a whole. Insurance for school boards is a requirement under the Education Act under Section 54. So we need to be proactive so we do not get hit with a 274% increase like ASBE imposed on the Rural School Board Consortium last year. The group has since dissolved um, due to their insurance risk. Alberta Education's recent letter strongly encourages divisions to have staff working in school boards to be fully vaccinated or to have COVID-19 testing done every 72 hours as a condition of employment and setting new standards in the province. Our discussion points with underwriters are listed below and are quite concerning for school divisions as a whole. As known to all urban school insurance consortium USIC member school divisions USIC is currently in the market for a new commercial general liability insurance carrier travelers sorry um travelers canada is existing the public entity insurance space uh and this ha has brought on a cgl insurance capacity problem in the canadian market USIC's marketing team has been meeting both domestic and Lloyd's underwriters to secure this vital coverage. USIC's presentation has been focusing on how they are the premier education consortium in North America, and they have been differentiating themselves from pools in the Carolinas, Texas, California, Canada, and Alberta. They have been speaking to USIC's longevity commitment to the best risk management practices in North America, U6 proactive management structure review of claims on a monthly basis, review of emerging issues, U6 financial stability, U6 partnerships with government insurers, broker, attorney, auditors, consultants, risk mitigation strategy, legal guidance, and the role that boards have to keep students safe and under the Education Act. The discussion of the proposed decision in some school divisions around the province has forced underwriters to deal with this new exposure, future claims and costs associated with covering this potential coverage. It covers the cost of your legal defense and will pay on your behalf all damages if you are found liable up to the limits of your policy. CGL coverage is one of the most important insurance products due to the negative impact that a lawsuit can have on a business and because such liability suits happen so frequently. 
Underwriters have brought the following questions to the various education insurance consortiums operating in Alberta before they consider offering a renewal quote for school divisions across the province. One, are all members of the various education consortiums aware of some board's proposed decision to allow unvaccinated employees to continue to work with children? Two, given the recent underwriting meetings that the education insurance consortiums had in London, have all school divisions that belong to these insurance pools voted on the decision that they will allow some divisions to go against the Government of Canada, Alberta Public Service, Health Canada, AHS, and Alberta Ed's recent decision requiring employees to become vaccinated as a condition of employment? Three, have these boards contemplated their decision with respect to the education insurance consortium wide repercussions and insurance? Have they been advised of the precedent that they will be setting, which is outside the recommendation of the various health experts in Canada and Alberta? The decision of these boards to not require mandatory vaccination could have financial implications for all boards in Alberta to secure commercial liability insurance. The boards contemplating this decision are contravening advice given to them by the government of Alberta, Alberta Public Service, Health Canada, AHS, and by Alberta Education. They are also making a decision that is going outside the norm with respect to the new vaccination practices and requirements in the private sector and other public organizations across Canada to stop the spread of COVID-19. Four, underwriters would like to know if the education pools, USIC, will be willing to exclude boards that do not follow proper risk management practices as recommended by the health authorities from purchasing excess and umbrella liability insurance policies through the pool. So access liability insurance provides additional coverage for one of your liability insurance policies, typically general liability insurance. It activates when they, the, that policy reaches its limit. Commercial umbrella insurance provides additional coverage for several of your liability insurance policies. It kicks in when one of the underlying policies reaches its limit. Five, if the education consortiums, consortiums vote on the matter before these non-compliant boards, would they consider removing the boards that do not comply with the pool's risk management practices from their pool? to protect the access layers from financial harm and reputational damage. USIC would be willing to remove Red Deer Public School Division from this consortium to continue with the group's risk management practices. Red Deer Public School Division would need to try and obtain new access and umbrella liability insurance policies. This would be difficult and costly as a new insurer would want to know history and risk exposure. Our current policy coverage costs approximately $780,000 at a potential increase of 274%. That would be an increase to 2.1372 uh, sorry, million dollars, an addition of $1,357,200 per year. Six. Underwriters are concerned that they could be held vicariously liable because of the language in the education's pool insurance layer has limited coverage for COVID-19. The access policy could be drawn into a claim due to the language contained in these layers. This could have an adverse effect on shareholder value. They are seeking a legal opinion on this matter. Risk management practices, proactive management structure, review of emerging issues, U6 partnerships with government insurers, broker, attorney, auditors, and consultants, risk mitigation strategy, such as doing the norm, legal guidance, and the role that boards is used to offset the limited coverage for COVID-19. Seven, lastly, all of these markets are new to the education pools in Alberta. They are quite concerned to be starting a new relationship on such rough ground as known to all school divisions in Alberta, the insurance commercial insurance market is extremely volatile. In the past two years, Alberta has seen an education reciprocal exchange in the province of Alberta fail, as be due to the hard market conditions and poor performance. It will be challenging for markets to believe in education insurance pools commitment to risk management. They may wish to charge a risk charge to insure these pools for their non-compliant members. This could potentially double the premiums currently being paid. If underwriters seek an actual supporta 
um, a way of determining, accessing, and planning the financial impact of risk levels. They may not offer quotes based on the potential financial harm on a consortium-wide basis based on the decision of some boards to not follow the advice of health professionals and vaccinations. So this was received from the senior vice president of Marsh, McLennan. So that is the information I have. I will now open up the floor to trustees at this time um, for conversation. Trustee McCulley. Thank you, Trustee Buchanan. Um, <clears throat> I think it was very important that we shared all that information because this is what we need to make this decision. It's a very important decision and it impacts more than just the individuals in our schools because the individuals in our schools have life outside the schools. So if I may, I wanna start with reading a letter and a statement that was released on September 28th of 2021 from the ATA. It goes on to state, Reasonable policies that require school staff to be vaccinated against COVID-19 are being encouraged by the Alberta Teachers Association. The association is releasing a statement that encourages the government of Alberta and in its absence, individual school boards to introduce such mandates and outlines the specific conditions required to develop a reasonable mandate. It goes on to have a statement from Jason Schilling, who is the ATA president. The best way to support student safety at a time when so many students cannot be vaccinated is to ensure that the adults around them are vaccinated. We cannot mandate vaccination for our members, so we are making it clear that we believe those who can, like the government of Alberta or individual school boards, should. There is a lot of information on the ATA website, and it also gives a link to their policy and statement. And it goes on to say what should be in the policies. Uh, a couple of them are, it needs to be consistent with provisions in the collective agreement. It should comply with Alberta human rights legislation. These next couple points are something that I want to leave food for thought with our board. It also states that it do not impose that we should not impose disciplinary measures for non-compliance, but provide non-disciplinary disciplinary alternatives to vaccination, such as ongoing submission of results. Temporary and include measures to ensure the policy is periodically updated and reviewed given the involvement and the involving and dynamic nature of the pandemic. So what I read and understand from that letter is that the ATA supports it, but they also have some recommendations on possibly what should be included in the policy in regards to those that um, cannot get vaccinated i i am i am driven by a couple of statements that were mentioned by chair buchanan um we've had a lot of discussions around this board about covid and our most recent one was around masking for our students that are too young to receive a vaccination. They are our highest at risk population because they cannot receive a vaccination. And one of the things I need to consider in how I will vote is allowing unvaccinated employees to work with these children. That, that is very heavy on my mind. And then we talk about risk management and we talk about liability. And as I read the statement from the ATA, it says the government of Alberta or our other governing bodies, and we are that other governing body. And what I see here is 
I heard it stated on a CBC talk show, uh, we're doing governing acrobatics. One part of the government will do one thing and then they will pass the buck to another governing body. And here we are below the government of Alberta, but still a governing body. And we're asked to make a decision that um, we really have to look at the liability. We have to look at the risk, risk management and we really have to think about what is the right thing to do. So all those things are in my head now. And I wanted to read that statement from the ATA because I think it's very, very, very important when we make this decision. Um, we have our own, all we all have our own points of view of how we feel about vaccinating and mass and what our role is in this district. And at this time, I am leaning towards supporting a policy or a motion that encourages mandating vaccinations for our employees in our schools. But I'm also going to listen to how the rest of my board speaks at this time, because I think there is a lot of knowledge in this board, but that is how I'm leaning at this time. And I am done for now. Thank you, Chair Buchanan. Thank you so very much, Trustee McCulley. So you are not making a motion at this time, correct? No, I'm not. Okay, thank you very much. I did see there, sorry, there are so many people on my screen. I am having to scan. Trustee Peacock, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Buchanan. Um, so school boards are once again tasked with making public health decisions to combat COVID-19. So over these last two months, since the middle of August, uh, the board has received many, many emails, mostly from parents and staff, uh, some in support of additional health mandates and some opposed. Uh, many of these emails are quite personal and you can feel the anxiety uh, that is being expressed by the sender. So when, we, when I receive these emails, I certainly carefully consider them. Um, uh, they are very personal. And so I have spent many hours con considering and researching the wisest decisions. With regards to considering a vaccine mandate, my opinion on the safety and effectiveness of vaccinations will not change anyone's position, nor should it. I, I don't have a medical background. So what I did is I looked to public statements or postings made by Alberta medical, educational, and government leaders over the past couple of weeks. So on September 30th, Premier Kenny said that um, all public servants will be required, all Alberta public servants will be required to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 or provide regular negative test results. Uh, he said, we, we value our public ser servants and the important work they do. That's why we want to ensure they're operating in safe workplaces and we're doing everything we can to protect the millions of Alberta, Albertans to whom they provide services. Uh, the joint letter from the Ministers of, of Education and Health, which was already read uh, by Chair Buchanan, um, it is just noting that it is also clear that the best way to look after each other and to stop the spread of COVID-19 is for every eligible Albertan to get vaccinated. Um, a renewed call to all school authorities as employers to develop policies that require proof of vaccination or a negative test. Um, Trustee McCauley already spoke to the uh, statement made on September 28th by the Alberta Teachers Association, um, just highlighting one part. The association released a statement that encourages the government of Alberta and in its absence, individual school boards to introduce such mandates meaning regarding uh, vaccinations. On October 7th, the Alberta Medical Association on their website had a statement calling for stronger measures to combat COVID-19, including mandatory vaccinations for public gatherings, schools, and workplaces. Uh, Alberta Health Services on their website on October 7th, just a statement including that said, vaccines are a critical way to limit the spread of COVID-19. 
They were are effective and safe. Immunization protects your health as well as the health of your loved ones and the community. So uh, those are the statements of the leaders of our, our in, including in areas of education, medicine, and the government. Uh, clearly, the responsibility has been placed on school boards regarding uh, vaccine mandates. Uh, there's no question about that. Clearly, these groups, uh, these individuals or associations believe in, in vaccines, uh, the uh, value of vaccines. Um, I will leave it there and turn it back over to Chair Buchanan, uh, as I too am interested in hearing the uh, comments from my fellow trustees. Thank you so very much, Trustee Peacock. Trustee Steubing. There we go. Um, I have watched this discussion carefully over the last several months, and particularly the last two months, when uh, we have received a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, mail and calls uh, regarding uh, the pros and cons of a staff vaccine mandate. Um, and I feel rather awkward confronting this issue. I've considered so many different aspects of it. I've considered the nuances. I've considered the, the advice from different uh, credible um, organizations, but I'm faced with two other considerations. The first one is that uh, I will be a trustee for another three working days. And I'm expected to vote on a motion that's going to preoccupy the board for some considerable period of time, because I do not believe, obviously I do not believe that a decision one way or the other by this board this day uh, would end the debate within our district. If anything, it will exacerbate the date, the debate. And that disturbs me. I feel a little unwilling at this late date to impose my perspective on the following board, but um, I will note uh, that in my previous uh, eight terms, uh, as we hit the last day of a particular mandate, we did exactly the same thing. And I never really reacted strongly to it until we hit this one, and there's a strong division around the issue. It's much more controversial than, than end of term issues that we've dealt with in the past. And I'm more uncomfortable as a result. Having said that, I wanna say something about uh, uh, the government of Alberta. Um, I'm tempted to use some derogatory language here. I don't believe that they are serving the public in good faith. Uh, they have been elected to review important issues and make decisions on our behalf collectively. And what they have done is made a decision to pass the buck yet again. This is a practice that this government has employed every time there's a controversial issue that comes up. Let's pass the buck. Let's give it to somebody else. We've been given the responsibility for medical decisions uh, several times in recent months. And here we have yet again another one. Um, and the minister is uh, 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 quite happy to inform us that the premier and all these other organizations urge us to um, support a mandate for staff vaccination. Um, and uh, we should do it. And my big question is, you know, if it's so important to the province of Alberta and its government, why can't they impose that mandate themselves? Why pass it on to individual school boards? We hear they read the letter that, or hear the letter that Nicole read um, uh, from the insurance industry, and where we have some boards that uh, support a mandate and other boards that do not, all of a sudden, our insurance policies and our insurance premiums go all haywire. 
And there's no compensation for this from the government. So we're given the responsibility to make decisions. And if we don't make the, the approved decision, we'll get penalized, if not by uh, the government, at least by the insurance industry. And assuming that kind of additional liability for the next board makes me feel very uncomfortable. So giving a particular mandate to the next board and a potential financial significant potential liability to the next board, as I said, makes me very uncomfortable with respect to this particular issue. Against that, I know, as several of my colleagues have already noted, that the most effective defense against the pandemic is vaccination. And the more of the public who are vac vaccinated, the better. Well, I believe that. Um, and I believed it when uh, I was uh, very young and the salt polio vaccine came out. Um, I was living in Winnipeg at the time, and as you will recall, Winnipeg was described as having a polio epidemic. And they, in fact, constructed two brand new hospitals just to handle polio victims. And those two hospitals are still in, in use primarily by now elderly polio victims who continue to live their lives in iron lungs. And so when the salt polio, vac polio vaccine came out, there was a lot of public rejoicing. There was some skepticism, but there was public rejoicing. And how was it handled in Winnipeg? The vaccination of school children of all ages was compulsory. We all had to be vaccinated. The same was true in the Sabin uh, uh, oral vaccine it came available some years later. The same was true when we had the tuberculosis vaccine and it goes on and on. I grew up in a context in which public health issues predominated and the idea that we would make vaccination compulsory was, was obvious. If vaccination is the best defense against these kinds of invasive diseases, then anything we can do to enhance the rate of vaccination is a positive. And somehow when it got to COVID, this whole perspective on vaccination changed. Personally, I blame a lot of the political machinations south of the border, and I won't go into them, except to point out that there's a very substantial politically connected lobby against any form of mandated uh, results. And you can see this fighting back and forth, you know, from silly issues like masks, important issues like vaccines. And it's become an issue amongst us as well. Left to our own devices, I'm not sure that it would have been or if it had been, it would be, have been conducted in a much more civil and moderate tone. But it hasn't been and it isn't. So we have this debate. We have um, questions for this board that will have implications for the next board. Okay. And we're asked to make a decision. And in my mind, I know that the rational decision is to say, go with the vaccine mandate because it greatly improves our ability to protect our population, including and especially our children. That's not shared why, uh, uh, by everyone, but I believe that. So for me, with some apprehension, 
I anticipate, depending on the nature of the motion that is proposed, that I will vote for a staff and vaccination, vaccine, I'll try that again. I will vote for a staff vaccination mandate, not happily, not fully comfortably, but recognizing its necessity, despite the contrary sides of the debate. And I expect that the, the flood of email I've received um, prior to today uh, will in the next couple of days, as this becomes known, uh, increase somewhat. Um, well, I'm prepared to accept that. Uh, I'm sorry that that's the situation. I'm sorry that that's the context. And I wish that this debate had been much more reasonable and rational. And based on the science of the situation and not a lot of bogus conspiracy theories that I have heard spouted towards me all over the place. There have been millions upon millions upon millions of vaccinations worldwide. And the negative consequences of those are absolutely minimal. That's not the way it's always reported. And some of the reports are exaggerated. Some are entirely fictitious. If you want to hear fictitious reports, just tune in to Fox News. So I'm unhappy with the context. I'm unhappy with the issue. I'm unhappy with it being forced upon us by a chicken. Sorry, I was about to say something I would regret. A less than responsible government. And I resent the fact that it is here upon our table, and particularly from my point of view, this close to the end of my last mandate. I don't believe I served 26 years on the board to be put through the ringer in this way, but here it is. And I would, I will support a mandate, but I do it unhappily and with a degree of apprehension. But the alternative frightens me terribly. So Madam Chair, I offer that as my position and perspective and no, I'm not gonna make a motion either but I expect that somebody will. Whoops, wrong button. Thank you so very much, Trustee Steubing, Trustee Woodward. Okay, so I've written down a few comments to make sure that I cover my points. I'm disappointed the provincial government has downloaded what should have been its responsibility yet again to boards. This discussion is divisive in communities instead of inclusive and unifying. We have had enough of division and discord. We need to focus on what we can agree on, causes that bring us together, work that uplifts and encourages, healing that we can all participate in and building for the future. I think that's why we are here today because we all care about our children and about helping them build their futures. We are all weary of divisiveness, yet here we are again, faced with an incredibly difficult and divisive decision. It is frustrating to say the least. I believe that although the province would like us to take action immediately, that we are not in a position to do so. There are many unanswered questions and potential negative impacts on our valued staff members in particular. We have heard from many staff members over the past few weeks who have had many questions. Trustee Peacock said these are personal and powerful emails and discussions, and I would agree with that. I thank every single staff member who's reached out to us. Your opinions and well being matters immensely to me, and I would argue to every single person on this board. I would like us to pause to find more answers. This would serve the purpose of ensuring Red Deer Public takes time to consider this very serious decision adequately and also gives the benefit of providing our new board more detailed information. As Trustee Steubing alluded, he's not 
running again, and neither am I. And the new board will, will deal with the consequences of our decision if we make one today. And I think it would be best if that new board was able to weigh in and have adequate information. So for instance, I would like for our insurance company to provide additional and more clear rationale for pushing our board to implement a mandate. I don't think, I don't understand why they are saying that by not imposing a mandate, there is an increased financial risk. I would like more clarification than has been provided to us. Also, what are our insurance options? What are the legal implications of a vaccine mandate? For instance, if a staff member felt forced to receive a vaccine, vaccine to maintain their livelihood and then experienced an adverse vaccine reaction, what would Red Deer Public's liability be? Will insurance be covering that? What do the lawyers say about asking that of our staff? Also, what are other liabilities we should be considering? I would like us to consult a lawyer and get clarity and more information than we have now. What other options could we consider other than mandating vaccines? The province and our insurers are suggesting rapid testing as an option to consider. I would like to gather information about that and the costs of it. I would like to more clearly understand the impact of the vaccine mandate for staff. I would be interested in having a survey that would allow staff to anonymously and voluntarily report their own vaccine status and to ask unvaccinated staff members if they would be likely to continue with the division should a vaccine mandate be put in place. I think we should understand if we are going to lose staff as a result of a vaccine mandate. And how will that impact us as we strive to respond to learning losses created by COVID? In summary, a vaccine mandate is a very, very serious step. We are being asked to do something that has never been done before. That should make us pause and consider our choice very carefully. This choice may impact our staffing levels and our insurance coverage. It could have health implications for groups and individuals. It could have a long lasting impact on people's income and lives. Each employee and each student in Red Deer Public is valued. Therefore, this is a high stakes decision with many ramifications. I would respectfully ask our board to ask administration to gather more information from our insurers, legal representatives, and our staff, and provide this new information, provide this information to the new board. I am asking us to be careful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Woodward. Trustee Manning. Thank you. I, first of all, um, would also like to echo my thanks to the staff who have, and, and the community who have taken the time to write some very heartfelt and uh, personal emails. <clears throat> when one is faced of losing their job after 20 or 25 years, I can imagine it causes an awful lot of stress and anxiety. Uh, we are living in a world right now that is full of stress and anxiety. My objective is to try and mitigate that and relieve that and help people through this. One of the questions that I've always struggled with is what, what risk does it pose to have an unvaccinated person in our building. Unvaccinated individuals can get COVID and can transmit it. Vaccinated individuals can get COVID and can transmit it. So I, I struggle with the logic of anybody who says that, um, that it's a high risk situation to have an unvaccinated person in the building. Uh, and that's one of the questions I'd like to ask the insurance company. Um, what, what, is the, what is the ultimate catastrophic event that, that they're afraid of that we would encounter um, and that they are afraid of that would happen? So far, the only risk I can see 
is that we have an insurance company, our USIC, or an insurance consortium that is telling us we must. And um, I also have some other questions around that. What are the rural boards doing now? Um, uh, now that apparently they have been, their, their consortium has been dissolved. I'm not sure what they're doing for insurance and how they're managing that risk. Um, I'd, I'd like to understand how more about USIC and how many uh, people, how many boards are a member of USIC and if, you know, what the mathematics are around what happens if one or two or three or four of us, or however many, decide that we will not mandate vaccinations. Um, I'd like to know the legal issues around human rights. Uh, we have a contract with our teachers and with our QP. Um, I, I, I don't know how I can go outside of the four corners of that contract at this point and say, oh yeah, we signed that in good faith, but now we're adding um, a, a, an obligation for you to be able to come to work that you must be vaccinated. Um, how many staff have we do we have that currently have had COVID and carry with them um, immunity at this point? I don't know the answers to those questions. How many staff will we lose, as Trustee Woodward alluded to? Um, and how would we replace them? Um, you, you know, there's there's an awful lot of questions that I have around here, around the issue more questions than I have answers. And like uh, Dr. Steubing said, I am I am very leery of putting into the hands of a new board a situation that, that they would be forced to deal with. And I would rather give that new board a whole pile of information to be able to look at and review uh, which might set them up for a, a better and more successful uh, decision. So that's that's where I am at. Um, I have searched my soul. I have searched my soul and I have searched my heart and I have tried to come up with some reason why I should be making this decision on behalf of people. And I can't, I can't find any reason. I, I need to treat people the way I would want to be treated. And I wouldn't want anybody to tell me that I have to take a vaccine in order to hold my job, especially after I've worked for them for many years. They were good enough to be in our building last year and the year before, uh, whatever their personal health decision is, they're good enough to be there today, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I would um, fall on, on, the, on the side of delaying the decision, seeking a whole lot more information and leaving that decision in the hands, that information and the decision in the hands of a new board. Thank you very much, Trustee Manning. My turn now. So I, this may be a little bit lengthy and I will apologize for that in advance. First and foremost, I want to thank every single one of our staff members for everything that they have done over the last 18, 19 months and prior and ongoing. It has been nothing short of absolutely remarkable. And I know that your mental health has suffered. I know, um, I know that this is impacting you. I truly do. And I can personally say that because my employer has done the same thing to me. So um, 
I'm going to start by saying I think there are a lot of things that we can all agree upon. First and foremost, we don't want anyone to get sick. And we certainly don't want anyone to die, especially not our children, especially not our children. And I am positive that we can all agree on that. Our staff, students, and families have gone through an extremely unprecedented 19 months. I think we can all agree upon that. The posing views and opinions have created divisiveness in our community, our homes, our relationships. And I think we can all agree upon that. We wouldn't be having this conversation today if it didn't. What we don't agree upon is the solution. This has become problematic as we have all seen, hence why it is one of the big questions in this current election cycle. When I became a trustee, I didn't think that I was going to be speaking to whether or not someone should be vaccinated and potentially risking their livelihood as a result of. I am not qualified as a medical professional. I do not hold a scientific degree. I also do not hold a law degree. For this reason, I am not in a position where I can in good conscience segregate or discriminate against anyone based on a medical decision, regardless of what that happens to be. I think if we step back and stop fighting with each other long enough to see what we agree upon instead of what we don't, we may actually come to some sort of resolve. So, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Can someone tell me if you see that? Because now I can't see you. Uh, yeah, I can see it, um, Nicole. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So we are talking about vaccine mandates for staff. I want you guys to watch this. If it's going to open for me. Okay. Is a video popping up? There we go. We don't have a video, Nicole. Can you see this? No. Nope. Okay, hold on one second here. What if I go like this? Can you see my screen now? No. No.
I'm going to do it a different way. Just give me a second here. Can you see my screen now? No, oh, starting to load. Perfect. Says we can and it's presenting. Thank you. No, we can. I'm Nicole Buchanan and I'm the board chair of Red Deer Public Schools and these are my daughters, Taylor and Peyton. I am a graduate of Red Deer Public Schools and I have two daughters who are entering the school system. I want my children to be prepared for life just like I was. As a board, we share the responsibility with parents and teachers to foster a lifelong love of learning and strong core values in our students. Parents want to be confident that school will be a positive experience for their children and that goes beyond just the academic aspect. It's about building citizenship and character and also developing the real life skills and qualities that will help them be successful in their futures. Ideally, students will come out of their homes with, you know, good, strong characters and values, but sometimes there's there's spaces and gaps that, that need to be made up and schools help give that child a sense of a, a broader sense of community and it, it gives them exposure to cultures and values that may not be exactly what they have at home but about what other families and other children experience as their reality. Well, it's important to teach values to children because they are the future of this great community. It takes a village to raise a child and that child has values of what that village will become. I've been in enough of our teachers' classrooms to see that we do a lot more than just teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, on a daily basis, we're teaching great character values and character traits that I think will build fantastic citizens for a great future. Uh, the unfortunate thing is I don't think the community often understands that. I think the community thinks we're just about teaching that curriculum. And so to me, it's important that they understand that we teach those values every day in every classroom. And it's the same around our entire district. It's important that our board define what our values are. We talk to our community about what values they thought were important for our students. Here are our values for learning and life. Treating someone, including yourself, with respect means to interact with them in a way that shows you care about their well-being and how they feel. It is important that we see the value in everyone and celebrate our differences. Respectful means keeping our school clean. Respect is accepting all cultures. I am respectful of others and their learning. Respectful is throwing kindness around what comes to Being curious is having an eagerness to learn more, exploring possibilities, and making the whole world your classroom. To be curious is to never stop asking why. Curious means diving into a new adventure. Curious means opening your mind to different languages. Curious video. Imagine the possibilities. Being responsible means doing what you think is right and always accepting responsibility for your actions. Responsible is working hard at learning a new language. I'm responsible because in our construction class we use power tools safely. 
Responsible is asking for extra help when you need it. Responsible is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Collaborative. Working together allows us to find the best solution to any problem. Collaborating with others is how you create friendships, see things from other perspectives, and come up with bright new ideas. Collaborative is working together to finish a project. Collaborative means teamwork, and teamwork means working well together. Collaborative means working together to create beautiful pieces of music. Collaborative. Together we can do the impossible. Resilient is being able to bounce back from challenges, disappointments, or adversity. You've got this. Resilient means never give up. Resilience is walking that graduation stage. Resilient means getting back up again after you fail. Life can be tough and so can you. Healthy means your mind, body, and spirit all working well together so you can be the best you. Healthy means always being active and doing things you love and never refusing your carrots. I am healthy because my faith and culture are important to me. Healthy means swinging as high as the sky. Healthy is powering your body, brain, and soul. We teach a lot of things academically in the classroom, of course, um, literacy, numeracy, social studies, science, but I think we also teach a lot of values as well. And I think that's our job to teach those values too. And how we teach them is not always through direct teaching, always, it sometimes is, but it's also through how we, um, what we model in our classroom, what we celebrate in our classroom. Uh, and I think it's a very important part of our job. It, to me, I guess the important uh, thing is that, uh, you know, when things are tough, when we're in difficult situations, and, and it's our values that, that help us out with those and help us make good choices um, and help make uh, our community a better place when we have good uh, good character, good values. And there's the values associated with uh, being lifelong learners, and there's uh, uh, that's a, a value uh, is just getting better at, uh, at what you do. And, and I think that uh, it uh, it's not a specific part of our curriculum, but again, uh, you're right, it's embedded in, uh, in order to, uh, to be a strong student. I truly believe that when we look at values or the social competencies that we would like our children to live, learn, and leave school with, it will guide them in their moral compass as they venture through life as an adult. And when we become inclusive as a district and we honor backgrounds and heritages and faith, that means that we're better together. So I think it's really unfortunate that our community doesn't always understand that you guys are working this hard on character values. And so I want you to help us with this. I want you to help us shape what this messaging could look like. And I really want every one of you to be out there pumping this message up for us. There's 1,300 people in our school district. If everybody shared the good work that we're already doing with character traits and character values, the message would be throughout our community. And the community would be saying what a great place for kids to learn to grow into great citizens. Thank you for um, watching that with me. There's a reason why I actually played that video is because not so long ago, our board sat down and had the conversation with regards to what our values are, what's important 
to us as a board, the values of learning and life that we want to instill in our children. I have never ever in my entire life seen such divisiveness in our community that I do right now. People with polarizing and opposing views fighting with each other. The narrative being, if you believe in one thing, you are pro. And if you are opposed, you are anti. I do not know how that does not create contention and cause people to fight when there is two sides. As parents, as teachers, as community members, we appreciate teaching our children to be curious to question what is happening around them, that there is more than one solution or answer to a problem. At what point do we become adults and start criticizing each other for the exact same thing? People who have stopped to question what is happening, why they are being told to be vaccinated when never in the history of time has this uh, there been a push like this, are being called anti. I know people who are waiting. Are they anti-vaccination? No. They want more information. Should they not be entitled to be receiving more information instead of just being told something that they have to do? They have to do it or they are going to risk their very livelihood that puts a roof over their head and food on their table. I cannot in good conscience say thank you to our staff for everything that they have done over the last 18, 19 months well out of the other side of my mouth saying, you want to know what? I don't value you if you don't get vaccinated for whatever your reason may be. That is fundamentally absolutely wrong to me. And I would not be able to look myself in the mirror. That is not showing or telling someone that you appreciate them. Because to me, when you do that, love is supposed to be unconditional. That's why I teach my kids that. You love unconditionally with no conditions. I appreciate every single one of our staff members unconditionally. That means I appreciate you whether you are vaccinated or you are not. And that should be your choice. So I'm going to go back into my presentation here because like I said, it will be So values for learning in life, as I've gone into that video, respectful, curious, responsible, collaborative, resilient, and healthy. We teach our kids these things, yet as adults, we are criticizing and fighting with each other for the exact same thing. Respectful. Treat others the way you want to be treated. I have heard and seen and spoken to more people over the last week, month, year, hearing about discrimination and how they are being tra treated with regards to their personal views. I would suggest that we are not all treating others how we want to be treated ourselves at this time. Curious. Again, we want our students to be curious and have an eagerness to learn, to explore possibilities. 
Yet, as adults, when we are doing the same thing, we are criticized. We are discriminated against. We are at risk of potentially losing our livelihood for being curious, for waiting. Responsible. So the choices you make and the actions you take. Being responsible means doing what you think is right and always being accountable for your actions. Some people, when it comes to the vaccination conversation, have made decisions based on the information that they have in front of them. Can they risk a potential vaccination injury? Can they risk potentially contracting the COVID-19 virus? We all teach our kids that in life, you get to make decisions, both good and bad, and they all have consequences. These decisions are being taken away from us. And I think it is important that we still be responsible and accountable for our own actions. Because if we don't have that, what then do we have? Collaborative. Again, without saying. the divisiveness that this has created in only seeing one way or another perspective. We are not collaborating with each other. We are not questioning, a, we, we all want to get out of this. I myself was raised that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We are in our 19th month of this. And the only path forward has been that has been said is vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. There are other countries and physicians out there that have explored and brought up other potential treatment options, other way, other ways of thinking, other ways of approaching this virus. And people shut the door and that's wrong. So again, why do we teach our children how important it is to be collaborative when as adults, we are not prepared to do the same thing? Resilient. Life is tough. And like I said, we all want to get out of this. That We have the same goal. We seem to forget that. We all want the same thing. How do we get there? Instead of fighting with each other, how about we come up with some solutions? Because as long as we continue to fight, there will be no solution. If someone's going to start at one and the other side's going to start at 10 and you need to get to five, you each have to be willing to move a little bit to get there. As long as you are steadfast in remaining at one or remaining at 10, you never will ever healthy we value being healthy healthy means mind body and spirit one of the conversations with regards to this has only been about physical health i am very surprised and shocked that we have not touched on the mental health and impact this has not this has had on our students and our staff, even having this conversation today. And for whatever reason, staff may choose to or not to vaccinate, that should be their choice. They should have the opportunity to weigh the risk and reward with regards to the information that they have. We trust them to teach our children. We value them to do that. Why do we not value them in making a, a decision that is good for them? 
Board responsibilities. School boards help shape the future of our communities by governing the education of young people. As citizens of your community, school board trustees make strategic decisions about the direction, delivery, and quality of public education. As people entrusted with the care and education of children, we are responsible and accountable to parents and the community at large. Nowhere in there do I see that we are responsible for dictating or telling someone what they should put in their body. And if it's there, please someone tell me because I don't see it. This accountability means that it is important to stay in touch with the community stakeholders. By doing so, we are in a better position to understand and reflect our decision making what all citizens value and want from their local public schools. The board has a responsibility to be in touch with the public's concerns, to make people aware of what the board does and why, and to give citizens every opportunity to have a say in what children learn. So I just want to say thank you so, so very much to every single individual who's reached out to me um, regarding this conversation. I truly do appreciate it. I've heard from both sides. I've heard people who believe that there should be a staff vaccination mandate. I have also heard from those that are opposed. I've heard those that are, are vaccinated themselves and opposed to a mandate. Um, one of the things I would like to actually, there's a couple. So I have a letter that's been signed by 36 people in the community. And it says, we the undersigned respectfully implore that the trustees of the Red Deer Public School Board resist the pressure to make COVID-19 experimental vaccines mandatory for school staff. First and foremost, please consider that the vaccines that are available for current use are still in the experimental phase. Even the Pfizer vaccine that has been a point of order, point of order. If yeah. I may, I'm going to challenge the chair. We were not allowed to talk or bring forward petitions regarding other topics that the board was talking about. And I'm going to be very specific about Pride Week. This um, isn't. A, this isn't. A I petition. feel you're going over and above your privilege as chair to speak on this with a very long presentation. And I would like to challenge the chair and ask you to please wrap this up so we can continue this conversation. Right now, it's been over a half an hour of a presentation, which was very well done. And, and I appreciate it, but that isn't the time or place for this at this moment. Trustee McCulley, can I ask why it is not appropriate at this moment? With our rules of order, you've definitely went over a half an hour of time. Nobody else would be able to have a presentation or an hour of time of talking on one conversation without having the option for other individuals who are part of this conversation to have their input. If there was going to be a very long, lengthy presentation, it should have been presented to the board at first for approval. This is the discussion. This is a debate. What I'm seeing here is a very long presentation. I think that this is an important conversation that we're having, Trustee McCulley, but I will respect your point of order and I will wrap up my presentation. I am also going to make the motion that Red Deer Public School Division Board of Trustees, and again, this has to be made in the positive, direct administration to seek more information with regards to staff vaccination mandates within Red Deer Public School Division. I have several um, 
questions that I would like address prior to having the conversation of whether or not to or not to vaccinate staff. Um, would you like me to read those or and see if we are in agreement? Are, are these going to be the directives for administration to seek clarification on? I believe so, yes. And that's why we will see if, right? And sorry, there are so many heads boxes in here. I think if it's part of the motion, we should hear the whole motion. So we've discussed the insurance. So I believe that there is more information with regards to the insurance conversation that we need answers for. Provided with our authority to legally, um, let's just say, let's look for authority with regards to the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, the Personal Health Information Protection Act, or let's just say legal. Um, I would like information regarding the prevention of contracting and transmitting the virus of COVID-19. Because we have spoken with regards to insurance, I think that it is important that we have be provided with the absolute risk reduction This includes speaking to people who have had COVID, are vaccinated for COVID, or are unvaccinated and have not had COVID. Trustee Peacock, do you want to get in on that? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause after what I had said before. I wonder um, if, if, if perhaps this would be two motions, one being suggested around uh, a discussion coming back to a future at a future date. Um, perhaps that's the way to go with some direction that with with administration providing more information or something. Um, and I wonder this specificity specificity the specifics um, if it's a lot of detail at this time. So what, that what do you mean by that, Trustee Beacock? That it's like too much detail. Yeah, I, I would think so, because I think that there may be that people agree with some of the information, they don't agree with some of the other information you're requesting, and then you've got to, the vote splits on whether or not that point I agree with and not that point. Uh, and I see uh, the superintendent has raised a hand, so. Superintendent Erickson, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to reach out to Secretary Treasurer Kearney and ask what the timeline is for the insurance as we are seeking that new insurance policy. Is there a timeline on that? Uh, yeah, unfortunately there is a timeline on it. The, the policy runs from October 31st, or sorry, our current policy is October 31st, 2000 to October 31st, 2021. So the new policy uh, becomes effective November 1st, 2021. So uh, there is unfortunately a time crunch on this. So uh, that would, uh, you know, the decision on this mandate uh, definitely determines uh, which direction we take with our insurance policy. 
my suggestion would be just to inform the insurance company that we've not made a decision and let them figure out what they need to do. Um, I, I'm sensing that this board needs more information to make a decision. And if the insurance company can't handle that, then we, we just have to try and work through that with them um, in, in whatever fashion we can. Um, you know, I understand that policies expire, but if we can't make a decision right now, we can't. Go ahead, Colin. I guess my suggestion would be uh, to appease the insurance uh, company would be um, something as the board is, um, as we, you've already, you know, spoken to looking for additional information to make a decision. Uh, that would probably appease them to a certain point. Um, but obviously, when they're writing a policy, they, they want to have assurance about uh, the level of risk that the board is willing to take, right? So um, I, I just know that that's, that's the deadline is, is uh, November 1st for the new policy to take an effect. But um, I think they're just looking for what the direction the board is wanting to go in. And I appreciate that, Colin, and um, you've done your due diligence informing the board of that as we work through trying to make this decision and trying to make the best decision possible. Um, so I think we have to just take that under consideration, appease the insurance company, let them know that we are doing our due diligence and trying to make the best possible decision we can for our staff and our community. Um, and that should make any insurance company feel really good about us. All right, so I moved the Red Deer Public Board of Trustees direct the superintendent and administration to come back with more information surrounding legal insurance. And I think that those are the two big ones, right? Trustee Woodward? I, I don't know if this is the rest of the board's wish or not, but I would like to seek more information from staff as well, which is what oh, I yeah. said in my statement and how it would Im impact our staffing levels. So as well as receiving information from our staff and the impacts on Red Deer Public School Division staffing levels. That sound okay? Any suggestions on how we gather that uh, information if we are asking for private information? Is the accuracy of that information? Trustee Woodward? Uh, I think there's no way to guarantee the accuracy of it. I think we would have to rely on people's um best information i think if you make it anonymous and you make it voluntary um then you hopefully get more accurate information but it's self-report it would be self-reporting like a, that's what i imagine in my head a survey that is anonymous and it is voluntary and it allows staff to um, have no risk in responding and then we hope that they are accurate with us and do our best with that information. Trustee McCulley. So I, I can't say this any better than what Trustee Woodward just said. We're not gonna get 100% and we are unsure of the accuracy. So why do we want that? What we do have is a statement and policy from the ATA already. So that is in there. Um, I do have some comments about the proposed motion that you have on, but that is my comment about having staff being um, asked more questions at this time. I don't think it is going to be accurate, and I think that would really um be a negative influence on how we proceed further 
Chad? Yeah, I would just like to suggest that the recommendation or the uh, motion include conversations with our ATA local as well as our QP local and classified staff representation because we have to remember we have more than one employee group within our division. Thank you. I, everyone in agreement with adding that? I think that that's important. Shake thumbs up or... Okay, so that'll be added because I think that that is important. Um, can we touch on the ATA? Um, how is the motion reading right now? Can someone read it to me, please? No, give it my best shot here. So that the board of trustees direct the superintendent and administration to seek more information for legal insurance, as well as conversations with ATA local, QP local, and classified staff regarding the impacts on staffing levels for an informed decision regarding the vaccine mandate for staff. Yep, I'm good with that. I will call the question on that motion. Oh, Trustee Steuben, go ahead. You're muted. Colin, uh, did I hear you say that we direct the uh, superintendent and the ministry? When you're reading the motion? Administration, not ministry. Well, thank you. I was going to say if we're directing the ministry, that's a cute trick. But thank you. Trustee McCulley. Thank you. Um, there should be time to allow for comments before the question is called. I'll just point that out. So I, I've heard some interesting things around the board during this meeting. And I want to remind my fellow board members that we have a due diligence to be a trustee until election day. And, and it, it concerns me that those not running for re-election are wanting to not continue that role and responsibility. In all openness, none of us could be here after the 18th, but that does not influence or impact on how I'm going to be making a decision right now, because my job right now has been the same job for the past four years in regards to student safety and governance for the Red Deer Public School District. There has been a comment or question around high risk. Yes, those that have had the COVID vaccination have unfortunately still been impacted by COVID, but there's been so much information out there already, so much factual and so much clear information from those professionals when there is 80% that are dying from COVID that have not been vaccinated compared to 20%. That has been very clearly stated and it has been talked about by the press conferences put on by our province. Again, we've also clearly heard from the ATA how they feel about a mandatory vaccination policy. And now we are discussing that we want more information. We were very, barely, we were talked about in clear and concise terms from our letter from the ministry and from our letter from the insurance company on the timeline and what the potential costs are going to be. I am unsure what more information we need. 
what I would put money on is that those that are opposed to vaccinations are always going to be opposed to vaccinations and that those that are for vaccinations are always going to be for vaccinations at this time. We've had over, we've had almost two years of information and dialogue and I have not seen a lottery or a hundred dollars incentive change people's mind on how they view it. They may get the vaccination because it impacts whether they have a job or not, or whether they will get a hundred dollars or not, but their views on the vaccination are still the same. Would I see this as just another way of passing the buck? And as leaders of this district, I think we are not doing our due diligence by passing the buck again. Yes, we have heard loud and clear on both sides, those that are opposed to mandating vaccinations and those that would like it mandated. And my voice is for those that don't have a choice. Those children 12 and under that cannot be vaccinated, that are put in a school with adults that choose to not get vaccinated. Now there is a difference with those that choose not to be vaccinated and those that cannot be vaccinated for a variety of medical reasons. And that can all be addressed with additions to the mandatory vaccine policy if that is put forth. I was one of the first trustees that spoke in regards to this topic. And I was asked at the end if I wanted to make a motion to be completely transparent to the board and those that will be viewing this meeting, I did not want to make the motion because we have six trustees on our board. If a motion is made and it is tied, that motion is defeated. My instinct was that it would possibly be a three to three vote. And I did not want to see the motion defeated. Now that is one of the issues that we have with governance. After October 18th, we will have seven trustees and that will not be an issue for the first time being in a long time. It is concerning that we have had a 3-3 vote on a few things regarding masks and vaccines around this board. We know where people stand. We know where they're gonna vote. And for most of them, their minds have not changed. So I don't see how adding a request for more information is gonna change that. But at this time, I will support a motion put forth for having more information because then it will be for a board of seven. And I hope who is ever on that board of seven, and you know how I feel about the word hope. So I will change it for trust. I trust that the board of seven will make an informed decision and will lead this district in a positive, proactive way in regards to this pandemic. It is tearing people apart, it is dividing them, and it is making this a very contentious issue where some places, in some circumstances, it can't even be talked to with a respectful manner. So at that time, I will wrap it up and allow someone else to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee McCulley. Trustee Manning. Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, speak to the motion and I wanted to be very clear about a couple of things. 
First of all, I have two colleagues who are retiring from the board and I think they have done their due diligence and I think they do care and I think they have worked through this decision right to the very end. Um, I appreciate their wisdom and their stick to itiveness to get to the end of this. Um, the second thing that I just want to make very clear in my mind and in the minds of those who have children in our schools is that I see children in our schools to be at the same risk of getting COVID from a vaccinated person as they are from an unvaccinated person. This isn't an issue to me um, about that. To me, this is a human rights issue. Um, this is an issue about choices and how adults make their health choices. I, I'm, I have other questions, um, Chair Buchanan, and I'm wondering if at, at a time after this motion, because I believe we've tried to encompass some of the things in the motion that we want to have answers to, but I'm hoping that if the motion were to pass, that I would be able to offer a couple of more questions at some point, not necessarily in this meeting, but be able to ask some more questions to have admin answer. And I think there they would be encompassed under the topic of legal um, and insurance. So I'm I'm hoping that I will be able to do that. But I will support the motion. Thank you very much, Trustee Manning. Trustee Steuben. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of observations. Um, a number of people have keep suggesting, and a lot of the mail keeps suggesting that, that this is a matter of personal choice and how dare the board impose its uh, preferences on individuals. Um, God help us, uh, we do that all the time in our society, okay? Uh, there's nothing magic about driving on the right-hand side of the road, but I'd suspect that if those of us who disagree and argue that that's a personal choice have not been terribly successful driving on the left or driving without a seatbelt. Another one that has always intrigued me, or certainly has come to intrigue me in the context of the present debate, is that we require uh, children entering school for the first time to have a host of, uh, of vaccinations so that we can present, prevent the spread of classical diseases in our schools. And by virtue of the fact that the kids are in school, I assume that they've had their vaccinations. Um, and now suddenly the parents are turning around and saying, no, no, you can't mandate vaccinations. This is a matter of personal choice. Well, not always, apparently. Um, when does it become a personal choice? Well, I guess the biggest reason I can answer that, for, uh, the best way that I can answer that is I say, it becomes a personal choice when I say it's a personal choice. You know, the argument is more rhetorical than anything else. As for the suggestion that, uh, um, people who are vaccinated communicate the disease. Uh, you know, just take a look at the hospitalization uh, statistics. Between 85 and 95%, depending upon the jurisdiction of those who enter hospital or go into the ICU, uh, you know, were not vaccinated. A much smaller proportion were vaccinated. Many with just a single vaccination. But to suggest that you know the probabilities are identical, no, they're not, not even close. Okay, and we know that. Okay. I mean, I guess I've heard a lot of rhetoric around the table today, and it kind of disturbs me. I was disturbed early on by the fact that I was being asked to make a decision 
right near, right at the very end of my term. And I was disturbed by the fact that the provincial government saw fit to download this decision making on school boards rather than doing the appropriate and responsible thing. Okay. I've been disturbed by what I've seen of a lot of the arguments that there's more rhetoric than fact in many of the discussions. I'm a little disappointed to see that there's a, subs a substantial helping of rhetoric around this table. And I think it's our inclination to download the responsibility for this one to the superintendent and say, please, Mr. Superintendent, could you get us more information? I'm sorry, I don't understand how much more information is going to help. I don't believe it's going to change any of our opinions or our, our positions. But it's one way to delay the issue. It's one way to get out from under the issue. It's one way to kick the can down the road. As I mentioned earlier this, in this discussion, I am personally very reluctant to do that. I'm not happy to make a decision, but I'm reluctant to kick the can down the road. I'm going to be voting against this motion. Thank you very much, Trustee Steubing. Trustee Manning. I just wanted to clarify, <clears throat> pardon me, to clarify with the superintendent, um, do we require any kind of proof of vaccination for a student to register. I'll pass that over to Colin. I believe that regulation changed in 2019. Uh, for a student to register, we do not require um, any proof of vaccination. Thank you. Trustee Peacock. Thank you. I, I would uh, speak against the motion. I think we have the information we need today to uh, make a decision. We are an experienced board. We know there's a very steep learning curve uh, for a new trustee. Uh, and I do think that um, delaying this decision um, allows this is uh, this is a decision that is time sensitive. The longer uh, whether you support vaccinations or not, the, if people are supporting them, not getting vaccinated, the longer you go, the more COVID spread there is. Um, I think when you are a leader, you don't get to choose the decisions that come before you. Uh, but in fact, uh, when it, you react to decisions as they come up, and I think this is something that has landed in our laps. Uh, as I said, clearly the responsibility is ours, and I think we should address it today. Thank you very much, Trustee Peacock. Trustee McCulley. Thank you. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, Trustee Peacock. I, as I stated before, I don't think there's any more information that we could possibly get that would um, change my mind, because I'm only going to speak for myself. But I'm also going to say again, if this current motion goes with a 3-3, it won't get passed, which means that we have to address mandating a vaccine. And if that is 3-3, that won't get passed. So um, my reasons, again, for supporting this motion, as political as it is, and darn it, I am a politician, but sometimes these games are just don't make sense. I will vote to support this. So then the new group of seven will be able to make a decision and it won't end up in a 3-3. Thank you very much, Trustee McCulley. Um, 
and I know that there has been some comments with regards to rhetoric that was spoken at the table. Um, any information that I said that had any was actually from the FDA Health Canada or the CDC. It was not from off stream media. It was actually from reliable sources. Um, and I know that uh, Trustee McCulley, that one of the words I, I said is kind of where you call the point of order. Um, and I have information from the FDA to support that. So just would want to clarify that. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Please record the vote as four to two. Trustees four, Chair Buchanan, Vice Chair Woodward, Trustee McCulley and Trust, Trustee Manning, sorry, so many, so many screens. <laughs> um, trustee is opposed, Trustee Peacock and Trustee Steubing. Since we have been talking about that for two hours, um, I think that we should take a little bit of a breather um, and take a five, let's say 10 minute break. So we will return at five after three um, for people to have a restroom and grab a coffee or whatever to come back. Okay, five after three.
All right, the time is five after three. Ooh. We will resume with our agenda. 10.2 enrollment summary report, Ron Eberts. I will make this very short. Uh, our numbers, uh, our official September 30th numbers, or 29th numbers, were 10,893 uh, bodies in our school division this year, which is up 100 from last year. We didn't you know, fully get back to where we were um, pre-pandemic, but I do think that the, uh, the increase is positive and hopefully it's a trend moving forward. Thank you. If there's any questions, I will answer. Thank you so very much. I don't see any questions. I'd be happy to move acceptance of the report as information. Thank you, Ron. All those in favor? And I don't see Bill Trustee Steubing being back. All right, carried. 10.3 staffing report, Rob Moulton. Um, you can see in my report, I have a quite bit more information than last year. I keep adding to it and making it a little bit more thorough. And you can look at last year's uh, comparisons. Uh, you've likely had a chance to read it, but there are some things I wouldn't mind highlighting. First of all, uh, you'll see that our district staff went up for last year. And the reason that it did, that, that includes everyone. So we're talking all the extra cleaners that we ended up hiring and every substitute that we could find. So that's why that number is a bit higher in contrast to teacher and EA FTE that went down. And that's because uh, budgets went down. And so there had to be adjustments at each school level to adjust for that. And it wasn't significant over the whole district picture. So you might have lost FTE from smaller buildings and, and larger FTE from uh, bigger buildings. So that's where it accounts for that piece of going down. Um, one thing not in the report, though, that I think is uh, very significant, and that is this spring, we had well over 100 people still applying for teaching jobs in many situations. And even as we got later into June, well over 50 and 60 for almost every job that we had. So we're getting a massive amount of people applying for jobs still and the quality was very high, which brings into my last point. Uh -huh. I just have found over last year's hiring that encompassed all of last year and coming into this spring already, significant reports from principals just saying that the teaching quality of our new teachers is exceptionally good. And when I say new teachers, I mean new teachers, but also new teachers to us in some of those situations. So, but the but because the, the numbers are so high, the quality has just been outstanding. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so very much. Trustee McCauley. Thank you, Mr. Molson. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I would love to hear it from somebody of your caliber to answer. Would a trustee be considered staff? Um, that's an inter interesting question. I guess I'd have to look into that further. My, I'll take a shot at it. I do think they would be considered staff, but I'd probably have to get verification on that piece. And one of the reasons I'm asking about that is because of the information that we are asking for from our previous conversation, that would include trustees as well. I was anticipating the question just over the last minute or two. I was, I was thinking that I might get asked that question. So my best guess is yes. Okay. Um, I'm sure the next board at the next meeting will have all those things to consider. So, Thank you for this information. I'm glad to see that we have great and qualified staff in front of our students because gosh darn, they deserve it, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look for a motion. Trustee I would move it. Oh, sorry. It's okay, Trustee McCauley, you can. Sorry, so moved. I wasn't sure if Nicole could see people, so I wanted to say it. Thank you very much, Trustee McCauley. All those in favor? Carried. 10.4, report from Technology and Information Services, Associate Superintendent, Ron Eberts. 
Ah, thank you very much. And I have uh, Mrs. Tracy Wertman. I can't see her on the screen, but I know she's um, her square is somewhere there as well. Um, we're just going to take a little bit of time to uh, kind of review some of the things that we've done over the past year and also give you a preview of some of the things that are happening uh, throughout this upcoming school year. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk for about uh, two or three minutes and then um, uh, Mrs. Wertman will carry the bulk of the load as she's my new rock star, so I will share my screen to start with. So to begin with, uh, I just want to give you a preview of our team here. Um, here's most of our, our folks. Uh, there's 13 of us all together. Uh, we have a number of IT specialists. Uh, those are the folks that are kind of where the rubber hits the road. Um, our IT specialists work in the schools predominantly most of their time, um, helping with, uh, and if it's a tech issue, they probably are the, the first person to, to see it and do something about it. We also have uh, two system analysts. Those are our uh, Dave and Dale here that do a lot of our information services, student records, uh, programming, that sort of thing. Um, Robert Bastel is our network administrator, and I'm going to touch a little bit more about some of his work um, uh, up soon. Jeff Gisson is our hardware technician, does predominantly uh, AV work now, um, also does our Chromebook repairs. Uh, Don Paul is our asset specialist, and of course, I mentioned Tracy Wertman is our new EdTech coordinator this year. Uh, some of the things I want to touch on, uh, I want to touch on Net 2020. Um, some of you might remember uh, a year ago, we were just embarking on a, a network upgrade for the entire division. Um, I'll give you a progress update on that. Uh, talk a little bit about our compute, cloud computing transition. Um, talk about two of our, um, oops, I put two cloud computing there twice. Our workflow process software and our LMS uh, project. And also, um, like I said, Tracy will spend a lot of time talking about some of the work she's doing uh, from an educational technology point of view. I wanted to start with Net 2020 and uh, the work that uh, Robert Bastel has been doing over the past year. And uh, this is, uh, I did share this slide with you last year because it was kind of the first stage. So you might remember, if you remember from last year, over the course of last year, we were physically replacing the network equipment. So what you see on the, the left-hand picture there is what many of our network closets look, not many, I will say almost all of them, looked similar to what you see there. Um, replacing the equipment gave us a chance to uh, make, you know, when you look at that rack on the right, that is the exact same rack that on the left. Um, so not only did we replace the equipment, we took the opportunity to make things a lot neater. And Every one of our schools uh, has been completed now. So if you went into Hunting Hills to Glendale or any school in between, um, our network closets are, are very aesthetically pleasing, but that wasn't the best part of the, the network. What this slide shows you is what, you know, I guess logically what our network looks like. We have our internet connection, we have router, routers, switches, access points, cables, servers, policy, um, it's extremely complex, but the whole point of our upgrade, what we wanted to accomplish was, even though it might be complicated on the back end, we wanted it to be super simple for the people using it. Um, so we adopted a, a, tech, a, like a, a technology philosophy called Fabric. And Fabric, you can think of as a, a, basically a layer, like a layer of network. So you can see in my picture here, um, these are three of several layers that we actually are implementing um, now that our network upgrade is finished. So for example, guest services. If you are a guest, which means you have a device that is unknown to the um, network, you're, you're going to have access to two, um, you know, as an example, two uh, directions. You can access our internet feed and you know, to our, uh, you know, our firewall of internet or our learning management system. Because we do realize that students and teachers are going to be bringing their personal devices on and they're going to have to want to access instructional services. We have our layer of educational services, which are all of the devices that our network knows about. Our Chromebooks, our division purchased uh, laptops, desktops. They have access to a host of things, LMS and internet, obviously, but they can print, they could cast their projection or their screen to this uh, 
to the TVs and the smart boards, um, a variety of things, but things they can access, for example, building management systems, because we don't want the average, you know, maybe a mischievous grade 11 student hacking into our HVAC system and, and wreaking havoc. So we have a layer of our vendor services, as an example. They have access to the internet because they have to download their updates and fixes, and they can access their software, but they can't do anything. So again, a, a rogue vendor can't come in, plug into the network and access any devices or services that they are not um, licensed for. So again, we're just at the beginning of this stage of implementing Fabric. Um, and this is kind of the main project that Robert will be working on um, over the next several months as we uh, really improve our network and make it uh, you know, better than it already was, which is fantastic. Now, the, one of the initiatives that we launched officially yesterday was our new learning management system. It's called Brightspace by D2L. Um, right now, it is being used by our at-home learners uh, under the principalship of uh, Stephen Pottage. They are our, I guess our pilot group. So our at-home learners that are um, obviously, you know, all of their uh, learning takes place online. They get to um, utilize this environment for their work now. Uh, we trained all of the at-home learner teachers over the end of September, beginning of October, and we officially launched uh, yesterday. So that was extremely exciting. It was uh, a long process starting back in the spring um, and we sort of brought that to fruition. So that's good. And the goal is um, by the time we end this school year is to have all of our elementary schools working in the new curriculum in this environment. Another big project that we just launched very recently um, that was going on since last spring was our uh, School Engage is the name of the software. But this is our form and workflow process software. Uh, so we have you know, well over 100 PDF forms on our website. Um, this allows us to uh, digitize that process. So we're just at the very early stages. We only have, I think, three or four uh, forms digitized. But again, over the course of this year, now that we have the system in place, um, we'll be able to digitize these forms. So now, for example, using the, the example on the screen, when a school sends out their field trip form, parents will be able to do their digital signature right on the form, um, submit any information, upload files if files need to be uploaded, and it'll be right at the teacher's fingertips, and they'll be able to print that information off if they need to, as opposed to the current model where the paper went home, parents signed it, teacher had to, you know, continually remind kids to bring it back and then have a stack of papers and where do you store those for legal purposes. Um, you know, that, that was, a, again, a long time coming. So we're very pleased with this. And then lastly, our annual instructional technology refresh. I wanted just to share what schools are getting a refresh of uh, Chromebooks. We are already very close to one to one. We're about 1.21 is the exact number to one in terms of uh, Chrome or students to Chromebooks. Um, and then we have a number of uh, elementary and K-8s um, and middle school getting uh, Chromebooks infused into their uh, learning environment. Uh, overall, a total of 655 Chromebooks are being uh, uh, implemented uh, this year. Um, and that'll, you know, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. But like I said, I want to leave most of my uh, remaining time to Tracy, our educational technology coordinator, because I think that's that's what you want to hear is how we're using all this technology that I shared to improve teaching and learning. So I will turn it over to Tracy. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well here. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today on a day that I know you've already been involved in such an important discussion. Um, but I'm very excited to share some details about my new role and about myself as as we move forward here. So as you've heard, my name is Tracy Wharton. I'm the new educational technology coordinator for our district. And I know that typically coordinators use this opportunity to update you on the past year. Um, having only been in this role since school started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the direction I, I intend to take this role. 
Um, a bit of background about myself is I am a former elementary and middle school teacher and also an administrator. Most recently, I spent a few years teaching at Barry Wilson School, where I was their instruct instructional design coach and their tech lead. And more recently, I was also one of the two vice principals at Norman Doe School for the past three years. So when the opportunity to become the educational technology coordinator came about, I was super excited. I firmly believe in the power of technology as a transformative part of education. I believe that it can enhance learning for all learners and uh, I'm, I'm really excited for the year ahead. Um, one of the first things I've learned in my role is that educational technology branches into every aspect in our district. Um, not only do I work very closely with the entire technology services team, but also uh, there's a, a high level of coordination with learning services, student services, and all of our leaders and teachers, students in our schools as well. Uh, one of the first things I did when I, I was hired on as the ed tech leader uh, was to set up meetings with the tech teams in each school. In some schools, that's an administrator. In some schools, it's an administrator and some teachers who have taken the technology role. And I had a conversation with each of them about where they felt their school was right now in terms of technology and where they'd like their school to be. And I was super excited because Many of the conversations that I had in the schools fit in with my philosophy completely. Um, so I'm gonna share with you my vision. Um, I believe, and, and this has been solidified for me after being in the schools, that technology has the power to greatly uh, transform what our students experience. If you would have told me two years ago that in the near future, though, every student, teacher, and almost every parent in this district would know how to log into Google Classroom by 2021, I wouldn't have believed it. What that did is it also gave me a really good understanding for uh, setting the bar high and knowing that our staff and our students can reach it. So I'm proud to say with this tech savvy staff and the desire to, to innovate, we are really, really well poised moving ahead. The time's never been better for us to truly dive into technology, how it can enhance teaching and learning. And so I'm gonna go through a few of the things here that, that I uh, specifically want to make sure are pillars for us moving forward. Oh, sorry. Can you still see my screen there? clicked on the wrong button there. All right, so uh, personalization of instruction and assessment is near and dear to my heart. Um, with technology, we are now able to have, we are now able to, as teachers, know where our students are at any given moment in the classroom. We have a live window into their understanding and we also have a lot more avenues and ways that we can differentiate for our students using technology. There are respectful ways where one student can be working on one thing and another student across the room can be working on something else. And uh, they don't need to be aware of what the other is doing. They also have incredible opportunities to collaborate with each other, to communicate with others. Um, our teachers have an amazing opportunity to communicate with teachers. And we've seen that, that there's been a huge um, growth in our critical thinking skills at the same time. So through technology and working alongside with our schools, I, I believe that we can make sure that every student in our district has learning that is appropriate for them, that their assessments are accurate indicators of their understanding, and we can uh, really help to fill some of those gaps and holes that have existed with more traditional methods. Now, uh, this fits exactly with what Ron was talking about. Our Brightspace learner management system that we have just started with our at-home learning teachers is one of the avenues that I'm excited to be a part of from the get-go. Uh, this allows us to flexibly plan our lessons. It allows teachers to uh, communicate with families in a very timely manner. And it also allows uh, assessments to, to come from a whole realm of, 
of uh, facets that learners can show their understanding on there. So uh, the time is perfect right now for our Brightspace learning management system. And, and I envision it's going to be one of the ways that we use technology super effectively in our district to reach every student. Now, um, another thing is, uh, as the educational technology coordinator, I get to go around and I, I get to support schools with the professional learning. And when it comes to all aspects of professional learning, technology is involved. We have learned a lot of things about technology in the last couple of years. And we've learned that it's possible to differentiate lessons. We've learned that it's well we've always known it's possible but we've learned with, we can make it more efficient i should say uh, we've also learned things about communicating with families we've learned about uh, making sure that we connect outside of our classrooms and so one of the things that i'm very excited about is working right with schools on planning their instructional design when it comes to utilizing technology not just using technology as a substitution for, for former methods, for example, a worksheet, but instead looking at, okay, what is the outcome we want the student to have and how can we really make sure that we have a deep understanding from the student at the end of that project. So now, um, and another thing is that we have been working so hard in the every year, but in the last couple of years, especially on, on being innovative and making sure that we were able to do things like teach online and assess online and reach learners everywhere. And I wondered when I got this job, would people be starting to feel burned out by that? Would they want a break from technology? And I was pleasantly surprised in my meetings with schools to discover that uh, there are a lot of people who are super excited about what they've learned in the last few years about how technology can enhance things. We have a number of tech leaders who are interested in collaborating with each other. Now, in the past, we've had a cohort called Red Tech. It's a little play on the words Ed Tech, Red Tech. And uh, it was an opportunity where leaders from schools would get together. They would share innovative ideas. They would troubleshoot things. They would learn about different things and de develop some curriculum, including our digital citizenship curriculum for our schools. And uh, in talking with our tech leaders in our schools, I found out that there is a strong appetite to revive Red Tech. So I'm super excited to provide and facilitate opportunities for the educational leaders in our schools to get together, to learn from one another, to take those ideas back to their schools and really, really um, accelerate Red Deer Public Schools as a leader in, in all sorts of instruction through technology. Now, that is my vision moving forward. Um, of course, I have continuing roles from what Mr. Trevor Pickert did before and Stephen Pottage. So I'll continue to support communications within our schools, um, amongst our IT staff. And uh, also, I already have some digital citizenship lessons and resources that I've, I'm sending out to schools, uh, also presenting with students, parents, uh, staff as well. We have our lending library that offers um, iPads and Chromebooks to students with unique needs. So I'm one, the one who helps facilitate making sure that those students get the resources they need. And likewise, our support for our Foundations and Pathways programs. Um, our Foundations and Pathways programs have unique programming at times. So we're looking at not only what devices do they need, but seeing if some of our district licenses that exist for other grade levels are appropriate within that realm as well. Um, assistive technology. What assistive technology is, is it's using technology to break down some of those barriers that our learners have. So uh, one of the parts of my job is to help support schools with that. And I've had the opportunity already this year to work with multiple classrooms on making sure all students know how to use those. And I love what I saw there because it was taking that Shelley Moore uh, model of, of give the tools to everyone and those who need it will use it. And I, I've seen that already being embraced across the district. And then, of course, some management of some of our things like our Alberta Education Digital Textbook Library and our CLD. CLW Community Liaison Worker Database. So making sure that we have the data to support the decisions and, and, uh, and activities within our school. So that is a little bit about me and the direction that I uh, plan to take 
educational technology in our district. If you have any questions for Ron or myself, I'll, I'll open it up. Thank you so, so very much, Tracy. I see a few hands popping up. Uh, Trustee Woodward. Not really a question, more just a big thank you. Um, I, I haven't had the chance to be able to work with you, Tracy, but I've heard from so many people write things about you. And so I think we are so lucky to have you in Red Deer Public. And I appreciate your enthusiasm and passion. I feel it from you even through the screen, which is amazing. Um, I just wanted to say that I think oftentimes as a, like, I'm not an educator, but I think sometimes it's a really fine balance between being excited about education and still making sure that the outcomes happen and they, you have to go down the middle. You have to do both. And I hear that and see that in the work that you're doing and just wanted to say, thank you. I'm so excited about it. And I think it's going to be amazing for Red Deer Public moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Woodward. Trustee McCulley. Thank you. I would like to also welcome you, Tracy, to the Red Deer Public family. I know you've been here already, but here's another part of the family that you get to know a little better. So welcome. Um, Ron, I have a question for you. When you were talking about Chromebooks and how many were in our schools, can you um, clarify for me, what do we use in the high schools? Uh, our student instructional devices are predominantly Chromebooks. I mean, both of our high schools do have, uh, we have some high-end digital animation courses and classes um, where they have desktop computers of a variety of caliber, like really high-end machines. But typically in our, your, your average, you know, chemistry, or English or social studies class, uh, students will be using Chromebooks in the high school as well. And are they allowed to take them home at the high school level as well? Rarely. Um, typically, it's 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 class by class. So a classroom will have a set of Chromebooks that they'll use when they need to. Um, it's it's very rare that a student will bring it home. But we do have situations throughout the district where there is a, a sort of a one to one. Um, for it's a special, if there's a specialized software on a, a device of some sort, that might stay with the student as the student goes throughout the school. But for the most part, uh, the Chromebooks are in a classroom and the students access them when they're there. Okay, is, is that possibly, or is that absolutely why the um, information that you showed us in the slides didn't have any high schools on there? Uh, no, just, just that this particular year, uh, all three of our schools with high schools students just weren't in the the mix what typically happens at especially at lindsay thurber and hunting hills is um we'll actually we won't buy them stuff we'll give them uh money because they they have a they usually do a lot of cascading themselves so they'll like when they replace a high-end lab it takes like a, you might be a hundred thousand dollars to replace 30 computers so they'll do a distribution of those computers because they're still really good computers, but not at the level that those high-end digital anim animation courses need. So they'll take some of those computers and cascade them to other locations, replace that big lab. So um, you know they, they 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 have a little bit more autonomy on their uh, instructional uh, technology purchases as opposed to the other schools where we we give them specific numbers of Chromebooks. Thank you. Your explanation kind of reminds me on how I buy gifts for my kids. When they were under 12, they would get actual gifts. And then as they got older, they wanted bigger gifts. So they just got cash or, you know, gift cards. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Tracy. Ron, I'm not sure if you have the numbers from this summer where the alternative programs offered their course through summer school to allow the high school students that took the course to have individualized Chromebooks. Do you have any information you can provide on that? Uh, yeah, actually, they're just distributed them today and tomorrow and maybe even Saturday, I think, morning. But yes, uh, over 400 uh, students uh, completed the, we, we call it the Chromebook Academy, but it was a series of uh, uh, CTS modules that the, uh, that we, uh, that it's a course that the high school, that outreach puts together. And if the students complete that course, uh, they get a Chromebook at the end of it. 
And we had over 400 students uh, complete that course and, and earn a Chromebook. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Associate Superintendent, Ron Eberts and Tracy. Um, I would look for a motion at this time. Uh, Trustee Peacock. All those in favor? Carried. 10.5 review board policy number 16 recruitment and selection of personnel superintendent erickson yeah this one's fairly quick because the last time it was reviewed by our board was less than two years ago uh, this december so the recruitment and selection of personnel policy uh, speaks specifically to hiring of administrative positions within red deer public so obviously it outlines how the board has the sole authority to recruit and select the superintendent or CEO of the schools for Red Deer Public. And then it also goes into describe the administrative staffing committee uh, that includes board of trustees representation when the hiring of our principals and our associate superintendents that we hire. And then with our vice principals, uh, we make a recommendation for the hiring of our vice principals when we go through that interview process. So. The, the entire policy, uh, I don't see anything that needs a massive change in that right now, given that it was just reviewed. Uh, but if there's any questions on it, I can try and address those. Thank you very much, Superintendent Erickson, Trustee Peacock. Well, I can't believe I was on the board two years ago. So if you look at number one, um, the board is the sole authority to recruit and select an individual. That's repeated in number seven. So that's the duplication. I mean, this is these are simple things, but I'm just, of course, the point being, how did I, how did I miss this two years ago? Um, also, number uh, four and number twenty are repeated. All offers of employment shall be conditional. So that's obviously a, a simple tidying up. Um, number eleven, the board shall select the superintendent subject to the provisions of the superintendent regulation just thinking that would be better to be positioned along with number one where we talk about the board um sole authority to recruit and select an individual so it's either part of that point or it's the next point in line just for uh cohesion on that yeah i may suggest even That's like a good the idea. regulations um just a, a small uh Clarification on number 10. So it says a standing administrative staffing committee, that would be an ad hoc committee. When those interviews come up, we say, hey, who's available and who's next? Because we try and go and give everybody a turn. So that'd be ad hoc. Um, and then I just, the one thing that I have a question about is um, in number one, the board uh will select an individual for the position of superintendent or anyone who is expected to act in the place of the superintendent for a period longer than one year now maybe that's out of the education act but that seems to me to be a really long time that the board would not have control over who that person is who's acting as superintendent uh, as i read it it would be the superintendent would appoint someone to to serve in that position for up to one year um and of course, we did originally appoint the superintendent. So I guess we you could say, well, we should be trusting that person to appoint their, re well, it's really a replacement for one year. So I'll, I'll leave that up to others. Uh, superintendent Erickson may have some comments and maybe like I said, it's in the Education Act. And those would be my comments on the um, policy. Yeah, I think uh, for anything under that one year, it'd be considered in an acting role. Uh, if it looked at being longer than one year, then it would be up to the board of trustees to have uh, be involved in that selection process. Thank you very much. Um, there were some things that were that Kathy brought forward, so I'll just get a thumbs up with we'll go through that th these ones and then we'll move on to others. So Trustee Peacock mentioned that number seven is repeated in number one. Our trust to thumbs up for trustees that are okay in striking out number seven because the exact same wording is in number one. 
Okay, good. Number seven is striked. Number four and number 20 are exactly the same, worded exactly the same. We can strike out number 20. Thumbs up. Fantastic. Good catch, Kathy. And um, there was conversation, a recommendation to move uh, number 11 to number one and add the rec regulations, a link for the regulations. Um, thumbs up for those that. that. Perfect. That has been done. Okay. There was, there was one more regarding, uh, instead of being a standing staffing committee, oh, be right. ad hoc. Thumbs up for changing it to ad hoc. Sorry, where was that? Can somebody say that again? Number, Number 10. 10. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you so very much, Trustee Peacock and Trustee McCauley. Thank you very much, um, Superintendent Erickson. I was wondering if you can give me a little bit of feedback with your knowledge on other cast members in regards to number six. Appointments to the following administrative positions shall be made by the board. Do you know if there is a large number, a small number, any number of other boards that actually have their board participate in the hiring of the vice principal, principal, and associate superintendent? Uh, not that I can speak to Trustee McCauley. I haven't spoken with my colleagues around the hiring process for principals and uh, other associates. Uh, of course, the appointments for vice principals are brought to the board for approval rather than the board be a part of the vice principal interviews at that time. If I may, I'd, I'd love to comment on that. I found sure. it very um it assisted me in my role as a trustee being more familiar with those that are in administrative positions in our district. So I, I appreciate that our um, board and our district um, participates that way and involve trustees. I know we make the decision as a whole, but I, I really appreciate that. So that's just my yay, I like it comment, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Trustee McCulley. Um, I know just in speaking to number six, because you've pointed that out, it the way that it is worded right now are appointments to the following administrative positions shall be made by the board, by 6.1, vice principal 6.2, principal 6.3, associate superintendent. I'm very familiar with what the word shall means. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we have to or that we, but right now, the board is only um, it has part is part of that conversation with regards to six point two and six point three principals and associate superintendents. Should the wording or that change in number six? Could I make a suggestion? Yes. That nine be listed in ahead of number six. Thumbs up for that. Okay, so we will move number nine um, into position six and then everything will just slide down. Any other trustee questions? Look for a motion. Trustee Woodward, all those in favor? Carried. Can I make a suggestion that we don't do policy work in December before Christmas? Because obviously many things were missed in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, 10.6 PSBAA report, Trustee Steubing. There. 
I only have uh, a few more minutes to actually learn when to turn on my mic. Uh, I might get it right before the end of this one. We'll see. Uh, in anticipation of the fact that uh, there's nothing coming up for PSBAA until after the election, and the big one coming up uh, for after the election is the fall conference and annual general meeting. Uh, you received some information on this uh, at the last meeting, uh, specifically the uh, uh, Lois Hall uh, lecture, which is fe this year is featuring uh, David King. Um, the uh, fall conference as a whole runs from the 17th to the 19th of November, and uh, the 19th of November is the fall general meeting. The agenda for the fall general meeting is now available, um, but I'm not sure who to send it to, to forward it to. So I'm going to wait until next Tuesday uh, to start sending this out. Uh, if you're confident of your re-election, uh, you could ask me to send it out in advance, and I don't object. Um, but uh, I will be sending them out to everybody who's uh, on the new board uh, next Tuesday. Um, there are a couple of things that are worthy of note. Um, one is, get my papers straight here. Uh, that wasn't it. The uh, objectives of the uh, association are being edited uh, and made uh, more concise, partly to make this uh, fit better with the fact that uh, the uh, separate distinction of public school education has been lost by the current uh, department. Um, and as a result, uh, uh, the objectives were changed to make them a little bit more consistent with this. Uh, the other one uh, has to do with uh, uh, the bylaws of the association. And uh, we have seen those uh, rather repeatedly for the last two years. And uh, uh, they're going to be finally approved. They're consistent with the the uh, format that, or the form that was uh, approved last uh, last year, last fall. So I, for those of you who are going to be around, I would call your attention to the fact that uh, the general meeting is open to all trustees who are are uh, part of a member board, um, and that would be everybody, not just the. Uh, um, uh, delegate uh, representative, uh, also to uh, senior administration with uh, roles that are consistent with the activity of uh, our participation in PSBAA, and that uh, um, registration for this event can be done online. Uh, there will be a link in the the. Um, mailing that I'm going to be sending to everybody on Tuesday can be done online uh, and quite easily and directly. And I would recommend this to everybody. Uh, just to put it into your consciousness, um, currently this is uh, being um, tentatively scheduled to be held at the Hilton Doubletree uh, Hotel in uh, West Edmonton. Uh, this is the one that typically in the past has been held uh, in Red Deer, uh, usually at the uh, um, what was used to be the Capri. Um, and the only difference is that it's a little later in the year because of the election. But this is the, the big annual meeting. So I commend it to you. And uh, I'm sorry I won't be there with you. But uh, I'm going to try and get in to hear David anyway. So that's my report, Madam Chair. 
Thank you so uh, very long, much. Long on uh, wordage, short on substance. Thank you so very much, Trustee Steubing. Would you like to um, make a motion for your report as information? I'll move my report be received as information. Thank you so very much. All those in favor, or Trustee Woodward, sorry, I see a hand raised. I just wanted to say really quickly that I think the PSBA video for the elections was really well done. It's one of the best I've seen. I thought it did. It was colorful. It was interesting. It was engaging. I just thought it was fantastic and just wanted to pass back my thanks to PSBA for such a great video promoting the value of public education. Thank you so very much, Trustee Woodward. I actually sat on the video committee and it was Dennis McNeil, who also sits on the video committee's son, who has been doing our videos. And he is an absolutely remarkable, <laughs> talented. I, I The conversations that we had surrounding the videos, like in one of them, we're like, can we put backpacks on the crayons? And he was like, yep, we can do that. Every, everything that we told him to do, like wanted, he was able to just do it. And it was so much fun and so easy and he is so talented so i um, love the crayons with the grad hat so. <laughs> that was another thing too is the grad hat so um yeah he, very talented individual and we were very very fortunate um to have dennis's son um do that for us so um trustee peacock yes i i wanted to thank uh bill for his commitment to PSBAA over the years. Um, Bill was there, I believe, at the start, which was probably 25, about 25 years ago when PSBA was created. Uh, at some point, uh, you were vice president of PSBA, and you have been our board rep uh, uh, over many times over the years. Um, and certainly, you've been passionate about public schools. Uh, you've um, been able to explain the legal uh, arguments when, when PSBA has been uh, a heavy intervener status. Um, and you've really brought so much of PSBA onto our board bill that no one else, none of the other trustees that I've served with could have done what you've done uh, for our board. But uh, thank you also for what you've done for PSBA uh, since its creation. Thanks, thank you, Kathy. Awesome, thank you. And again, what Trustee Peacock just said, thank you so very much, Trustee Steubing, for your dedication and support and love of PSBA ever since I was elected as a trustee in 2017. I knew where your heart laid with regards to PSBA and uh, thank you for mentoring me because I, I share the same passion with regards to being a part of that association. So thank you so very much for that. Um, Trustee Steuben, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify here for a minute. Um, I didn't volunteer to work with PSBAA. When I was fir first elected at our first organization meeting, one of the trustees at that meeting uh, who had been reelected, Lauren Goddard, told me that uh, there are two provincial associations that our board belongs to, and one of them is really, really good and he would therefore uh, require me, uh, I, that's his word, uh, to uh, be what was then called our designate for PSBAA. And my connection with PSBA then went the full term of my, full length of my 26 years of service. Um, but I didn't do it voluntarily. I did it voluntarily more recently, but uh, at the beginning, I had no idea what I was getting into, but I went because I was told that's what they were gonna do. Uh, and I just call attention to that fact uh, since we were talking a little earlier about involuntary mandates, tongue in cheek. Thank you very much, Trustee Steubing. Uh, with regards to your motion, receiving your report for information, all those in favor? 10.7 ASBA report, Trustee Peacock. Thank you. So, um... Much of the report, um, you know, that you have written, uh, I don't need to talk about. <clears throat> I will just note, though, and perhaps this is something that um, the uh, superintendent or the secretary treasurer will note that um, 
the orient the the first zone meeting and the orientation meeting are just a few days after the organizational meeting meeting for the Red Deer Public Board. So at that time, at the organizational meeting, a um, representative for the zone will be appointed by the board, and um, Yes, and for everyone involved on the board to be highlighting that that uh, meeting is follows you know three or four days or four, four or five days later, and the I think what's going to happen is the current vice chair, as I noted, uh, Lucy, she's been acclaimed, and uh, I think she's going to reach out to the boards, but the board anyhow they are looking for contact. It will be a um, virtual meeting, so uh, that's fine. And I did notice note in my notes. Um, just as a reminder, and, and if with the new board, if someone from the Red Deer Public Board is considering putting their name in as chair, which I don't know if they would be, but that they would discuss that with the with our with the Red Deer Public Board before and before November first, because it does take some administrative support from the district. So, and also at the end of this is the end of. Lorette's uh, two-year term as, as president or chair of the zone. And uh, certainly trustees have, and, and I can say this very wholeheartedly, trustees have really appreciated all the uh, organizational skills uh, and the kindness, um, uh, the example she has set her commitment to the zone because she has been in an awkward place at times between trustees and ASBA. And Lorette's been the one who's done a lot of contacting and following up with ASBA to uh, discuss the concerns that the zone had. So really well done, Lorette, and thank you for your commitment to the zone. And you are gonna be missed terribly at the zone meetings. Thank you to my board for trusting me with that opportunity. I'm very grateful for it. It's been a total privilege. I've loved working with the other trustees in the, other zone, in the rest of our zone. It's been an absolute privilege and thank you very much for giving me that opportunity and trusting me with it. And I would remove my report as information. Thank you so very much, Trustee Peacock. Um, Trustee McCulley, I see your hand raised there over my big mammoth of a dog's head. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, yes, I'd love to first off echo what Trustee Peacock said. Lorette, you ran a fabulous meeting and your relationships with everyone at Zone 4, magnificent. You know, well done. Um, I'd like to put in a request uh, to Superintendent Erickson, since some of our meetings that will be happening, okay, since most or all of our meetings will be happening in by Zoom in November, is it possible uh, to uh, reserve the assembly that way, um, trustees new and old can be in a safely spaced area, still participate, but be able to look six feet over at somebody and say, what did that mean? Why are we doing it this way? There's, there's nothing more um, horrifying than being a new trustee and being in a Zoom meeting all by yourself and not having anyone to talk to or have that connection with is, is that something we can at least reserve the um, room for at this time or do we need to wait for confirmation from a new board? No, I, we can definitely reserve that space and I see our wonderful admin assistant Mandy there. She and I had a brief discussion about uh, that week in November for sure with PSBA, SBA. Uh, and the importance of being in there, but we'll make sure that we have all health measures followed and uh, safe physical distancing for the new board to be in person and have some team building. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee McCulley, for that. I think that that's very, very important, especially in these times. Um, with regards to Trustee Peacock's motion, with regards to receiving her report for information, all those in favor? Um, and I just also want to echo what Kathy said with regards to Trustee Woodward. Thank you. Um, it has been nothing short of remarkable with what you've done with regards to being the chair at uh, Zone 4. 10.8, Superintendent's Report. 
Yeah, you can see it in front of you, a list of some of the activities I've undergone over the past month. One piece that I want to point out that I'm really making an effort uh, booking off Thursdays, either morning or afternoon throughout the year to spend some time in our schools, meeting with admin, meeting with staff. Uh, that's something as a new superintendent, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to do last year because trying to stay away from the buildings and not have a lot of traffic going through them. So it's important that uh, I be out and develop those relationships and be in our schools. So really making an effort to do that each Thursday, either in the morning or afternoon, where I, I find one or two schools to visit on those days and have those conversations. Thank you so very much, Superintendent Erickson. Look for a motion. Or any questions from trustees? Trustee Woodward? Just thought I'm prepared to make the motion to accept the report as information. Thank you so very much. All those in favor? Carried. 10.9 board chairs report. So this is a verbal report. Um, like I have mentioned, we had had some board chairs meetings with ASBA. Um, and there are going to be continuing meetings coming up into November and October. Um, with regards to my board chair's report, so I, I don't have anything official to say, um, but I just want to say thank you so, so very much to each and every single one of you over the last four years. Um, Trustee McCulley, thank you. Trustee Woodward, thank you. It's been an honor working with you. And you try, I'm not singling anyone out, you as well, Trustee McCulley. Um, Trustee Manning, thank you um, very much. Trustee Peacock, thank you so very, very much. Trustee Steubing, and if I could thank Trustee Christie, I would do that as well. Um, you guys were all absolutely integral in becoming a trustee and my role as vice chair and chair, I would not have been able to do it without you guys. Um, just to, we've been through some tough things together. Um, and even though some days we don't always see eye to eye, we are able to come together and respect each other. And I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for this opportunity for the last four years. I've had the opportunity to learn and grow. Um, and I, I continue to hope to have long lasting relationships with law with you all. So um, on that, I will then go into cell of, oh, I will uh, make a motion to receive my information or my report for information. All those in favor? Carried. 11 celebrations. And I will pull up the, I'll go down the list because in virtual land, it's easier to do it this way. Trustee Manning. Thank you, Chair Buchanan. Um, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to celebrate a couple of people here today. Uh, Lorette Woodward, uh, you joined our board back in 2017, um, a, a very young green trustee, and I have watched you grow and learn the role um, you are eager, you are willing, you are a servant. And um, I've, I've so appreciated getting to know you and being able to work with you. I know you have uh, decided to go on to other things and I wanna wish you every success in those other endeavors. But I do want to uh, really thank you for adding to the legacy of Red Deer Public Schools and leaving us a better place for having served with us. You've taught me a few things um, about how to communicate, about how to listen, about how to look a TV camera square in the face and talk with grace and um, intelligence. Uh, so just watching you and being around you has taught me a great deal. And as you head off into, the, into your uh, new world of challenges. I just, I know you'll take some of the things that you've learned here and you'll use them to benefit other people. And that to me um, is the best part about this job. So I want to thank you for that um, and wish you every success. 
Now, the second person that I just wanted to say a few words to, of course, is Dr. Stooping. We all know, Bill, that you are headed off into a nice retirement from your duties as trustee. You and I have served together for 26 years, and what an amazing opportunity it has been for me to learn from you. You've not just been a colleague, but you've been a mentor and you've been a friend. You're a good guy, Bill. You're a good guy. You have given so much time, energy, and wisdom to this board. I can't thank you enough. As we've traveled this journey together, we have done some amazing work. We started out green, but we did learn together from some of the best. And you mentioned one, Lauren Goddard. As we came to difficult decisions, we had to rely on that learning and move forward. You and I are no stranger to difficult decisions. Our first challenge was closing schools and I sat with you as you wept during the closure of Piper Creek. That little gem of a school that was so near and dear to your heart, you had to close it. I sat with you on the Central Elementary School Closure Committee Together, we felt the pain of parents whose schools were closing, such a special community that was of students who carried with them the real challenges and parents who loved them so dearly and just wanted the best for them. We faced strong emotions. We faced protesters in the parking lot. We faced evidence on both sides of the issue. And eventually we had to work towards the division school of inclusion. And we closed that little school again with tears in our eyes. Perhaps one of the most memorable conversations that I have ever had with you was the night that you called me and asked me to chair the Pines School Closure Committee. I will never forget that conversation. I don't know if you remember it, um, but I was not feeling like this was a committee that I wanted to be on, much less chair or, or uh, head up. But you as board chair phoned me and expressed confidence in me. You bolstered up my courage. You told me that you thought I could do it, that you thought I was the right person and you stood behind me and helped me face those challenges. You, you, you assured me that I was the right person, that I had a fair and balanced perspective and then I had the, abil the ability to, to have those difficult conversations with people. Um, that was a difficult conversation and it was challenging, but I think good things came out of that school closure, including the science and technology focus at Glendale. Sometimes we look to moments in our lives that define us and having somebody like you, Dr. Steubing, express that kind of confidence in me was a defining moment in my life. And I'll never forget it. And I can't thank you enough for that. So your work on this board has not only been just filled with wisdom, good thinking and being a smart person, but you've helped build up other trustees as well. And I've watched as you spent time with your colleagues on this board, talking to them about their opinions, sharing their opinions, having fights and getting over it. Uh, disagreeing with you is an, it's a, it's a yeah, a uh, regular occurrence, but we work it out, right? Um, you cared for your students at the college just as much as you cared for everybody else. And on a personal level, started off my daughter on her sociology degree on a good foot. You have indeed accomplished much in your 26 years, and I can't thank you enough for your mentorship and friendship. Uh, as many of you know, Dr. Steubing and I share a grandson. And so this will mean that we carry on our friendship for a, life a lifetime. Um, and we are so fortunate and blessed to be able to watch that little boy grow up. Stay safe, Bill. Thank you. Enjoy your retirement. We love you and we can't thank you enough for adding to the legacy of Red Deer Public Schools. I celebrate you and Lorette.
Thank you so very much, Trustee Manning. Trustee Steubing. Thank you, Beth. I feel like somebody just poured a bucket of warm maple syrup all over me. Um, I have learned from so many people and I've been blessed by the opportunity to learn from so many people. And I think of the people who have sat around the board table over the past 26 years and I would start the list with all of them. Um, not that I've always agreed with all of them. Uh, some of them I've disagreed with quite strongly, but I'm called to respect and to be collegial, but that doesn't mean that I have to agree. And it also means that I can't get upset when somebody doesn't agree with me. Although sometimes I do. Um, particularly if it's one of my children. Uh, I was going to save this for celebrations, but maybe I'll sneak it in here. Um, the past 26 years for me have been exceptional. Um, I have experienced more than I anticipated I would. I have learned more than I expected to. Um, I have participated in decisions and activities and, and initiatives that uh, uh, I had no right to expect to be even part of. Um, and through it all, I felt like I learned as much as of you concede that I taught you. I learned as much from you as you ever learned from me. The only thing that I would request of you, Bev, is that you'd stop talking about our relationship in the past tense. Okay, it is going to continue. And William is only one reason. By the way, for everybody else's uh, interest or benefit, um, on Monday, election day, our joint grandson, William, turns one. Um, so this has been a, a wonderful journey. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy with my opportunities to contribute, and I'm proud of some of the things that I did. Um, and I'm particularly grateful for the, the experiences that I've had because they have helped me grow. And I stop and think about it, you know, um, half of my teaching life was involved in, among other things, being a member of this school board. This is not an incidental experience for me. This is central core key um, to uh, uh, who I am today. And you're all part of it. And I just want to say thank you. That's an inadequate word. Um, but I appreciate every single one of you. And uh, when I say that, I'm seeing a whole host of people standing behind you going back 26 years. Uh, great people. Um, I was very fortunate. I was very lucky. And I'm very, very appreciative. Thank you. Don't call on me for celebrations because that was it. This was this is celebrations. So is you're good. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Steubing. Bruce. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our trustees for a great term. It's been a very interesting and challenging four years, but uh, it's been a, a term where we've been able to accomplish lots and make a big difference for students. In particular, uh, Bill Steubing, um, we go back a long ways, uh, even before your time as trusteeship. And I wanna thank you. You have been such a powerful advocate for public school education, and uh, you've made a difference on that. With Lorette, uh, we started out as friends and colleagues in the education communication, and I was delighted when we were able to work together as trustee and wish you the best in your future endeavors as well. So, and the rest of the board, we have, uh, had a great team and uh, 
uh, we've had some passionate discussions and it's always about our students. So I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Trustee Peacock. Thank you. And I, I, I do want to thank um, each of my colleagues um, and, and certainly uh, recognizing that we have had some tough, uh, tough discussions and times over the last four years, and we all deeply uh, do miss uh, Bill Christie. That was very tough to to lose a trustee. Um, and you know, I've often thought I wish I could hear his his voice on on different issues we've discussed. But I do feel blessed to have worked with you all and gotten to know you and and to have you as colleagues and friends. And I also want to recognize. Uh, the senior administrators that have sat around the table with us over the years and uh, appreciate uh, them and, their, and, and their, their wisdom at our meetings. Uh, some of those meetings have been very long. Um, so I just want to thank everyone and I do want to finish and I know we all do uh, with, with thanking the staff of our school district. Oh my gosh especially these last 18 months, but for all the work they do all the time. So thank you to everyone. Thank you so very much, Trustee Peacock. Superintendent Erickson. Yeah, it was a bit of a coincidence that we were uh, reviewing and revisiting policy 16 recruitment and selection of personnel today, uh, because I want to thank all of you uh, for taking the chance on me just over a year ago and selecting me, given that you have sole authority to select the superintendent. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the chance on me, uh, understanding the vision that I shared through, through the interview process. And it has been challenging. Uh, the vision that I shared and, and the direction that I shared that we would like to go as a division has taken a, a little bit of a side road down the pandemic corridor uh, that we will eventually get through and then continue on with the work that I know that we are going to be so proud to continue for the students and staff and families of our division. So uh, you guys have allowed me to fail forward, I'll call it, throughout the past year. Uh, I've made mistakes, but you guys have allowed me to make those mistakes and learn and grow from those mistakes. And for that, I appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, it's been a difficult and challenging year and a half uh, since being in this position. There's lots of difficult decisions that have had to be made, but again, uh, making those decisions, knowing that we have the full support of the board uh, always behind us as we move forward uh, makes a great deal of difference. Um, I can speak to the fact that you guys truly always have the staff and students at the forefront uh, even as far back as when I was principal of the alternative schools and we went through a transformational change. At the root of that, you guys knew uh, that students should be first and allowed us to make some pretty major changes to benefit those individuals. So uh, I look forward to uh, working with the new board as they come in next Monday, but I do appreciate the work and the support this board and the faith that you put in me when you hired me just over a year ago. Thank you so, so very much, Superintendent Erickson. Colin. I'd like to pass. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'd like to just thank everybody for the last four years. It's been, uh, been a great four years, flies by. It's amazing how fast it goes. And, uh, and I guess wish everyone, uh, you know, good luck uh, in the future. And hopefully able to see everyone and uh, in outside of the virtual world. Um, in the future and hopefully we recognize each other when we're in a three-dimensional view but uh, yeah thanks to everybody it's i've appreciated the support that you've uh, given for the uh the financial trials that we've had over the last few years but uh, i appreciate it thanks thank you so very much colin uh trustee mccully thank you uh, i think this is one of the better celebrations that I have been part of in a very long time. It certainly shows how our board and senior admin work. We don't only work from our knowledge and experience. We, we work from our 
our hearts and our emotions as well. And we have shown here a lot of respect and admiration for everyone on this virtual screen. Good or bad, I've learned something from everybody here. And we all bring something different to the table. And that's good. It is a really good thing. We learn from our mistakes. We learn from things that aren't our mistakes as well. We are constantly learning and we're constantly growing and we're moving forward. That is what I'm very proud of is how we are moving forward in this district. I wanna give a big thank you to the folks at Citywide that put on the election forum last week. It was great to meet some of the new candidates that I didn't know. I thought everybody presented themselves in such a magnificent manner. They answered questions. They showed where their passions were. They, sh they showed why they would be a great trustee. And we've been saying our goodbyes here. And I don't think anyone has actually said goodbye, but I want to just say so long, because no matter what happens on Monday, this is a permanent. Red Deer is small. We will all see each other in some place, some market, some something. And I also want to extend my appreciation to Trustee Woodward and Trustee Steubing and all they brought to the table and know that I am going to be thinking them them on the 18th and knowing that they just get to watch and cheer and their life is going to be the same no matter what the outcome is and that they have left some big foot not footprints is it? it's big shoes big shoes to fill not footprints and whoever is fortunate enough to be at this table after the 18th I know our district is in good hands because we have a great relationship with our senior admin. We have a great relationship with our teachers and our parents and our students. And I am quite confident on whoever takes that over, they're gonna keep moving that forward in a positive way. So my celebration is done. So thank you, Chair Buchanan. Thank you so very much, Trustee McCulley. Oh, my screen just bounced around. Um, Trustee Woodward. Wow, lots of thank yous, and that's what I was planning to, so I hope you'll be patient with mine. <laughs> I wanted to start out with a thank you to the voters for anybody who listens to this back later, this recording. I'm very grateful for this opportunity I've had to serve in Red Deer Public. I have learned so much um, about education that I didn't know before. Uh, before I came to Red Deer Public, I was a very firm believer in the value of public education, but I'm leaving with that even stronger in my heart. And my appreciation for Red Deer Public is even stronger. I think I will always be a Red Deer Public girl. Um, wherever I go, that will be a part of my DNA. So with that, I, I also wanted to thank a few groups of people and individuals. So. I'd like to thank the students, first of all. That's why we're all here. Every time I went out to schools, I learned from you, students. I appreciated your smiling faces. I appreciated the cute things you had to say or the insightful things you had to say, whether it was visiting with a GSA, whether it was helping with a musical, whether it was going to a school assembly, whatever the opportunity was, I always learned from you. And I, take your, your faces and I brought them to the board table with me and tried to make decisions thinking about you. So I hope all the best for your future students. I care about you. I think our future is in good hands with all of the amazing things that I see you doing. Second, I wanted to thank our staff as a whole group. Uh, one of the things I love the most about Red Deer Public is the family feeling that we have here. I hope that we can continue to weather the storm together as a group. It is something that's really special. Having been a person that's um, worked with other school divisions in Alberta, it's something that 
I really love about Red Deer Public and I hope we can keep that. I also wanted to say thanks to senior administration to Stu Henry, who the former superintendent who has taught me so much over so many years and was a great leader. I would like to say thank you to Chad Erickson for being a great superintendent. Um, I have always, ever, ever since you took the chair, have always appreciated your vision for the future. I think you've had more barriers to trying to achieve that vision than we ever anticipated for you, but you've navigated that road with grace. And I think your greatest strength in navigating that is your relationship building skill. I really appreciate that about you and wanted to publicly thank you for being who you are. You are a great leader. I also wanted to individually thank, sorry, I get emotional a little, Della, Ron, Dan, Rob, Bruce, Nicola, Colin, and Mandy. Each one of you have shown me patience for my millions and zillions of questions and for my seeking to understand. And I can think of individual moments when each of you have taught me something important. I take that with me in my heart. Thank you. And to my colleagues on the board, Bill Christie, I miss you. You were a gentleman to me right from the beginning. You were kind and encouraging when I needed it. Nicole, you are a friend that I didn't anticipate coming into my life. I'm very grateful for you. I'm grateful for your example of learning voraciously. I've never seen somebody take on learning at the speed of Nicole. And also you are willing to step up and lead in a difficult divisive time. It takes a strong person to do that. I admire you. Diane, thank you for your example of passion in your beliefs and never being willing to compromise on that. You bring a strong opinion to the table and I have learned from you. Thank you, Diane. Bill, you also were kind to me right from the beginning. I remember our conversation at Don Campbell and what you said to me there helped me finish the election. Thank you. And then even more, thank you for the last four years. I have learned so much from you about the history of education in our province in Red Deer Public, about social theories, about why things are the way they are. And I always could count on you, Bill, for kindness and wisdom. And I am so thankful to you for that. Kathy, you were also kind to me right from the beginning. You reached out to me right, right after the election. And I'm really grateful for that, that you included me in our group. You have integrity, you are thoughtful, and you always come prepared. And you've shown me an excellent example of how a trustee should behave at all times. Bev, as somebody wiser than me has said, you are the mom of Red Deer Public Schools. I think that's such a good description for you. I've appreciated the way that you lead with such love and kindness, and you always have such wisdom. Thank you for mentoring me. Thank you to each one of my colleagues for all the good that you do in Red Deer Public. As others of you have acknowledged, we don't always get along or see eye to eye, but I wanna say each one of you have taught me something amazing and I will take that with me and I wish to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Forever a Red Deer Public girl in my heart. Thank you so very much. I will finish off celebrations. I already said kind of in my board report with regards to thanking everyone. Red Deer Public School Division is like a family. Right from the board down, I felt it dropping my kids off at school. Um, we've taken on some tough things and we always are able to respect each other at the end of the day. Thank you so, so very much to each and every single one of you. Trustee Woodward and Trustee Steubing, I wish you well on your future endeavors. Trustee McCulley, Trustee Manning, Trustee Peacock, I hope to see you at the next board table. Um, I think that Red Deer would 
be honored for you to represent them again. Having worked with you for the last four years, I know that you care about the kids and students. And at the end of the day, that's why we're here. We're all here because we care about children and we put children first. Um, sometimes we maybe not agree on the path to get there, but at the end of the day, our that, that's our common goal. And that's the most important thing. So with that, I will adjourn at 4.30, our last board meeting. Uh, oh, trusty Stubing. <laughs> of course. Go ahead. Of course. Um, it's not unusual for me to get sidetracked uh, in discussion, but some people are experts at sidetracking me. One of them is Mrs. Manning. She's been doing it for 26 years. Um, and uh, I'm anxious to see after two, after Monday who she picks on for the next four. Uh, good luck, people. Um, but uh, I got sidetracked listening to Bev, and I forgot some of the things that I had planned to say, and I'd like to just quickly insert them. I'll keep it short. But the absolute highlight of my 26 years as a trustee has been working with all the capable staff of Red Deer Public, from teachers to janitors to you name it. Um, I even include most of the superintendents in there, Chad. Uh, um, I got to stop being a smart aleck. Um, nah, I won't. Um, and as much as I've enjoyed working with and getting to know so many teachers, wonderful people, I've particularly enjoyed the students, especially the very young ones. Um, they're so open and they're so uh, direct and um, they're so willing to share exactly what they're thinking. Uh, and it's a fascinating experience to experience the world through their eyes. The older ones are pretty sharp too. Uh, I don't know if Della's still on, on us the meeting, but um, the citywide school council or student council uh, has been a wonderful experience. Um, I've met some exceptional young people uh, who assure me, not directly, but just by their example, that the future of our community is in good hands. And uh, I look forward to what tomorrow will bring. And that having been said, Nicole, I will stop. I could go on for a long time. Um, we saw an example of that earlier today. But uh, uh, I see no need to try and emulate it or exceed it. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank everybody for their friendship and their for their, their um contributions to Red Deer Public, and I agree. Uh, I have said this before, and I will keep saying it for as long as I think I live, but of all the school boards in the province, and I have learned a lot about almost all of them, there's only one that I would be willing to be a trustee in, and it's this one. And uh, so in departing from this role, I am departing from trusteeship forever. Um, and uh, uh, I feel good. Okay. Thank you very much. Good luck to the four of you that are running on, on uh, Monday. Good luck to the one of you who's also running. Bruce, I'm talking to you. Yes. Uh, and I will be watching and listening to the returns and uh, cheering on and say, hey, I know her. Or I know him. Okay. And... Uh, as we go further and further down the road, more and more people are going to look at me when I'm saying that something like that and say, sure you do, Bill. Tell us another one. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much. Trusty Peacock, I see you raised your hand as well. Yes, I just want to spend a special thank you to Mandy, who has done so much for all of us. Um, she's, Mandy, you've, you've kept us honestly glued sometimes uh, because I, I, you keep track of us, you look after us, you, you treat us so, 
so specially that I really appreciate that. But yeah, I truly think we'd be lost without you. So a big thank you to Mandy. Agreed. Thank you very much. With that being said, the time is now 434. I will adjourn this last meeting of the term of 2017 to 2021. Thank you so very much. It's been a pleasure working with you all. Thank you. So long, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. So, Chad, I think I won. Good luck. Best wishes. <laughs> Actually, Bev, it's 435. That means it's 25 minutes from the time I selected and 35 from the time you selected. I said 403. So it's, I don't think it's a measurable difference, Chad. It is. Time is measurable. That's 10 <laughs> minutes difference. Oh, okay. I guess I know you want to tell Lerone. I concede. It was Beverly. Thanks what you much. meant to say, what you meant to say was you don't think it's a meaningful difference. Well, that too. <laughs> okay. What well, I mean is a little, little piece of a little piece of advice from 